wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera. Namun budaya, salam menjajikan untuk kita. Good morning, everyone. Uh, check. I would like to extend my respect to Dr. Harry Yogoswara, head of the head of Arbasasra Research Organization. Um, and um, Dr. Sylvan Narwidi, head of Archimedia Research Centers. And to our speakers, Professor Chris Clarkson and Dr. Cassie Norman, thank you for coming. Uh, good to have you guys here, for sure, in this lovely morning. And to the participants who raised research centers, colleague, and student from uh, universities. So I extend a warm welcome to everyone. The sharing session on, on left course and polygraphy reconstructions uh, held at FPC Yono Science Area, both those attending um, online or offline. And allow, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Anton Budianto, and I will be facilitating today's sessions. Before we start our session today, so let me proceed to the agenda of today's events. So, as a well opening speech by the Director of Research Organization of Archaeology, Language and Literature by Dr. Hari uh, Yogeswara, uh, and then following presentation on polydrug by, by Dr. Kasidarwan. And then we'll have a very short breaks, and then continue presentation by Professor Chris Clarkson on Stone Tools. And then we're going to have lunch break after that. And after a lunch break, we'll be continuing session on Stone Tools. And probably we'll have a napping, like mini napping session by the outside. So it'll be fun. And it'll be and then the closing remark by the head of Archimedes Research Centers by Dr. Sophie Norwidi. So uh, I would like to invite Pa Hari Yugoswara to give his opening speech for today's session. Thank you. Right. Baik, terima kasih kepada pewara. Uh, selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, dan Rahayu. Uh, yang saya hormati Pak Sofan sebagai Kepala Pusat Riset Arkeometri, kemudian juga kepada Kepala Pusat Riset lain yang mungkin hadir di dalam uh, daring, dan juga kepada para peneliti senior, para peneliti di lingkungan BRIN, dan juga kepada para peserta yang hadir pada saat ini, and uh, spe special thanks for Professor Dr. Chris uh, Clarkson from University of Queensland and Dr. Cassie Norman from University uh, Griffith, Australia and also for Tristan. <laughs> uh, sorry, I think in this sini I will speak campur-campur uh, ya, gado-gado ya, ya, English in Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, uh, jadi pertama-tama saya menyambut baik uh, pertemuan ini uh, kita sebut sharing session. Jadi kalau ada kata sharing, itu pasti biasanya berasal dari orang-orang yang memang pengalaman ya, ya untuk memberikan materinya. Kemudian kedua, tadi Pak Sofan membisiki saya untuk nitip khusus istilah paleogeografi. Ya. Saya sendiri antropolog ya, jadi kalau udah berhadapan dengan konsep-konsep arkeologi, saya harus hati-hati nih bahasanya gitu ya. Nah, mungkin satu hal yang paling penting adalah ketika kita bicara paleogeografi, maka menjadi satu hal yang sangat penting adalah memahami keragaman geografi yang ada di dalam satu wilayah begitu ya. Pasti akan ada perbedaan antara misalnya wilayah uh, savana ya, sabana, kemudian wilayah yang mungkin lebih dekat coastal atau mungkin wilayah-wilayah pegunungan. Karena itu sangat penting apa sharing session ini karena Di, akan dilakukan adalah orang-orang yang memang punya pengalaman begitu ya. Jadi waktu saya baca ini, waktu saya dengar nama Dr. Kasih, saya kira orang Indonesia ya. Because Kasih is really Indonesian name ya. <laughs> ya, ya. Ternyata dari Australia gitu. Dan kemarin kami sudah juga apa ada sedikit pertemuan untuk membahas uh, kemungkinan possibility for doing research ya 
in Indonesia dan saya kira ini juga kesempatan baik ya untuk nanti mengumumkan begitu dan sehingga kemudian apa bisa menjadi apa teman-teman bisa berkolaborasi dan juga uh, hal lainnya saya juga dengar laporan dari Pak Sofwan bahwa pertemuan ini yang yang luringnya ya apalagi pasti daringnya ya yang luringnya yang luring banyak dihadiri oleh teman-teman mahasiswa begitu ya dan juga teman-teman dari apa Sangiran ya Dijen kebudayaan lah ya <laughs> dengan teman dari museum begitu ya jadi ini saya kira satu hal yang yang sangat tepat ya uh, kebetulan sekali lagi kebetulan ya kepada teman-teman uh, Australia kemarin saya sampaikan bahwa kedatangan teman-teman ini tepat pada waktunya mengapa tepat pada waktunya karena kemarin kami baru saja melakukan sosialisasi tentang rencana kegiatan eskava, rim eskavasi ya jadi kalau ada dengar rim itu bukan kertas ya rim itu di brin itu artinya r i e m riset inovasi indonesia maju ya yang disebut strategis nasional eskavasi gitu kan ada kata eskavasinya dan eh, pada eh, tahun ini direncanakan akan dibuka di dua lokasi yang pertama akan dilakukan di Bumi Ayu ya. Bumi Ayu itu kabupaten apa? Brebes ya. Teman-teman ini dekat banget nih teman-teman Sangiran ke sana ya. Dan satu lagi rencananya ada di Bongal eh, eh, Sumatera Utara, Tapanuli Selatan. Bumi Ayu ya kira-kira eskavasinya akan lebih menyasar kepada isu tentang prasejarah ya, human evolution dan sebagainya. Dan kemudian kalau Bongal itu lebih pada early Islamic uh, civilization ya. ya seperti itu ya. Tapi untuk sementara kami siapnya untuk yang di Bumi Ayu dulu lah ya. Uh, rim eskavasi ini merupakan bagian dari uh, apa ya uh, program Brin ya yang kita sebut sebagai platform kolaborasi ya. Nah jadi teman-teman yang non Brin ini perlu selalu saya sampaikan di mana-mana. Brin, BRIN itu hadir bukan hanya untuk peneliti BRIN, tetapi BRIN itu hadir untuk seluruh kegiatan riset dan inovasi di Indonesia. Baik yang dilakukan oleh orang Indonesia, maupun nanti kolaborasi dengan teman-teman dari luar negeri. Ya. Nah ini perlu saya sampaikan uh, sekali lagi, ya seperti kegiatan di Bumi Ayu, ya. mudah-mudahan nanti kami kita ada sosialisasi eksternal. Nah di situ, kegiatan eskavasinya adalah eskavasi yang kita sebut eskavasi jangka panjang ya. Apa pengertian jangka panjang bagi kami? Penelitian itu akan dilakukan selama 5 sampai 7 tahun ya. Dan juga dilakukan setiap hari pada hari kerja. Mungkin bingung ya seperti itu karena mungkin selama ini kita ada kegiatan eskavasi tapi rata-rata mungkin durasinya 3 minggu, 1 bulan. Kalau ini kami akan membangun infrastruktur riset, termasuk akan membangun apa tempat untuk peneliti ya, ada ada uh, tempat untuk bekerja, ada laboratorium dan lain sebagainya. Dan kegiatan ini terbuka untuk siapapun yang ingin melakukan eskavasi, termasuk terbuka untuk para mahasiswa, ya. Jadi mahasiswa nanti kita melalui apa jalur MBKM tugas akhir ya kami undang untuk bekerja. Para peneliti rotasinya dua bulan untuk mahasiswa kita kasih bonus lah sekitar enam bulan ya mahasiswa lebih tangguh gitu ya. Nah jadi <laughs> ya six month in the field ya to do doing uh, excavation ya. Jadi uh, dan saya kira nggak usah terlalu menakutkan ya. Kalau anda anda kangen itu 20 menit stasiun Bumi Ayu sudah siap mengantarkan anda ke Jogja atau ke Jakarta gitu ya. Ini kita tidak di tempat lain yang remote ya. Dan juga kami undang uh, teman-teman dari MCB, BPK untuk bisa terlibat ya. Mudah-mudahan saya kebetulan sedang ada beberapa perbincangan dengan Pak Yudi begitu ya. Ya mudah-mudahan bisa ini jadi bisa mengintegrasikan kegiatan di misalnya Sangiran dengan di dan juga 
nanti akan ada uh, skema ya, skema namanya DBR ya, Degree by Research ya. Dan sekali lagi DBR ini tidak hanya untuk peneliti BRIN. Ya. DBR ini juga boleh untuk orang-orang di luar BRIN yang ingin S2 dan S3. Ya. Nah, seperti itu ya jadi gambarannya. Jadi ini satu platform yang terbuka. Karena itu kegiatan hari ini itu sangat terkait dengan kegiatan rencana eskavasi. Ya. Jadi uh, kayak pemanasan lah. I think uh, this occasion just like warming up for us before we start with the long term excavation in Bumi Ayu ya. Jadi saya kira ini satu kesempatan yang bagus ya. Uh, baik teman-teman yang ada di ruangan ini maupun yang ada di apa di uh, daring begitu. Dan juga semua skema yang ada di Brin kemudian pasti di dalamnya ada skema pembimbingan gitu ya. Jadi kalau yang untuk degree by riset itu akan dibimbing oleh para peneliti senior, termasuk kemungkinan akan dibimbing oleh visiting researcher maupun postdoc yang diundang uh, untuk kegiatan eskavasi. Ya, jadi mudah-mudahan apa kegiatan hari ini bisa betul-betul bermanfaat ya bagi teman-teman baik apa uh, yang bekerja yang sudah memang bekerja sesuai dengan tugasnya ya karena apa kalau mungkin sedikit bedanya kalau peneliti itu kan selalu merenew ya ilmunya ya sedangkan kalau kita sudah bekerja pada satu institusi biasanya bekerja atas dasar penugasan jadi sudah jelas lah ininya tapi uh, dalam dunia riset itu kita harus selalu mencari hal baru gitu ya nah, jadi saya kira sekali lagi saya menyambut baik ya and I would like to say thanks for all uh, Resource person ya yeah, for this uh, occasion dan saya harap kemudian bisa bermanfaat bagi uh, semua. Saya kira mungkin itu yang bisa saya sampaikan karena bukan sambutan yang penting tetapi langsung kepada materi yang akan saya sampaikan. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi Santi Om dan Rahayu untuk kita semua. Thank you. Baik, terima kasih kepada Pak Heri. Uh... We'll continue to next agenda, which will be presentation by Dr. Kasi Uh Before that, I will try to uh, read a little bit about your biography uh, to the attendees. So welcome back to Indonesia, Kasi. Uh, currently, Kasi is a research fellow from Australia Research Centers for Human Evolution at Griffith University. She's an archaeologist by trainings. However, She's also a geochronologist, especially on OSL dating methods, and also modeling on polygraphy and human dispersal. So very complete archaeologist. And several research grant and award has been granted in previous year, such as Legal Foundation Research Grant, Rock Art Australia Strategic Grant, and many more. Uh, she's been published numerous publications uh, in scientific, in scientific re, uh, reports, nature communication, quaternary science, you name it. So she's also active presenting her work on international seminars. So without further ado, please present your book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Anton said, my name's Cassie Norman, and I'm very happy to be here today. And I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Satikna Anton and the Archaeometry Research Centre for inviting me to talk at this workshop. Today, I'm going to be presenting on work from both Indonesia and Northwest Australia, detailing the use of a rapid archaeological site prospection method and the use of remote sensing data sets, very large scale data sets, to reconstruct past landscape occupation and paleogeography. So just briefly, in the first half of this talk, I'm going to outline a rapid site prospection approach, as I mentioned, and then I'm going to discuss case studies uh, from earlier work on the Indonesian island of Roti, where we applied this set of methods, um, and which I undertook with Dr. Satigna and many other Indonesian colleagues. And then I'm going to outline the final results of the Roti season and talk through the large amount of archaeological data it is possible to obtain using this site to prospection. So basically a different approach to traditional excavation. For the second half of the presentation, I'll be discussing the use of very large remote sensing data sets 
to reconstruct Pleistocene paleo landscapes and paleo geography uh, with a Northern Australian case study. So rapid site prospection allows researchers to quickly make a detailed assessment of archaeological sites with very low levels of site destruction. So as I said, it's a different approach to traditional excavation. And the reason for developing this approach is because the discovery, test excavation and dating of archaeological sites is often one of the most time consuming and low return components of any new archaeological project. This is always, there's always a really high degree of uncertainty as to whether a new site will yield the desired cultural materials and ages, as well as significant financial investment and site disturbance. And often you'll spend a lot of time and money digging a site and it'll come back sterile or just very, very um, you know, late Holocene. And you might've been interested in, in you know, late Pleistocene deposits. So the case studies I'll be presenting are in Northwest Australia, indicated uh, down in the red circle and uh, where we first trialled this approach. And then I'll talk about specifically the Indonesian islands of Roti, uh, where we developed it further. So this is just a visual outline of the workflow of rapid site prospection. And I'll go through each of these in more detail later. But essentially this method involves the coordinated use of ground penetrating radar, which allows us to obtain imagery of the archaeological deposit below the ground surface without having to excavate it. And this way we can quickly and non-invasively find areas in a cave deposit that are both deep and relatively clear of rock rubble. And this enables rapid evaluation of the subsurface structure of an archaeological deposit. And then it allows us to target the placement of either coring equipment for deep penetration through the deposits. We can identify the presence of artifacts and cultural behaviours, and we can date the material that we're bringing up. So you can see in these first two images um, on the, the top down view of the GPR imagery. So that's the, the bright blue and red imagery up the top there. And what this actually provides us is it gives us slices um, of what's in the subsurface topography as you descend down with depth. So you can actually see the emergence and presence of flowstone as it comes in and disappears and rock rubble areas. So basically anywhere that's um, is a an area where you've got a large object that you would really want to avoid. And those darker blue areas are quiet areas where you'd probably want to target your excavation trenches or your coring. So this can be done with a manual hand auger. Um, so you can see that far, far right image there. Um, and that way you can get a full sediment column down through the deposit. It's very non-invasive and creates very little site destruction as a sediment core basically has a circumference of only about 10 centimetres. You can then collect sediment samples from the core while on the site, or you can take the whole core back to the lab for later analysis. And this whole process only takes you about half a day per site. So a very large number of promising site locations that you can find during survey can then be tested in just a few days. In the lab, we can then analyze the sediment samples um, for, of the cores. For artifacts, we can investigate if there's burning in the sediment from ancient hearths. And we can also look at soil ge geochemistry and we can date both the organic and inorganic materials in that core. So we immediately know if there's cultural material at the site, um, how deep it is and how old it is. Together, this allows researchers to avoid um, allocating substantial resources to sterile or unsuitable deposits and maximises the potential to determine the significance and age of sites with a cultural sequence uh, with a minimum of effort or disturbance of the sites. So this uh, method was first developed by myself and Chris Clarkson for Arnhem Land, um, which is a very ancient cultural landscape with a high site density and deep sand sheets. And uh, an excavation in this region in Australia can cost between 40 to 50,000 Australian dollars. So if you have a specific research question or time period you're interested in there, um, and there's no guarantee the site you excavate will shed light on this. So what we decided to do was come up with a way to quickly assess many sites in a short field season. So we can then excavate only sites that were relevant to our research questions and avoid excavating sites that were not. 
We began by undertaking surveys for new archaeological sites in Arnhem Land, and then we returned, and in a few days, we were able to sample all the sites that showed good potential um, for human occupation, which is what we were particularly interested in. So once sites um, are identified, the first step, as I mentioned earlier, was to undertake ground penetrating radar at each. Um, so I'm going to go into a bit more detail about this technique for those who haven't seen this in action before. But basically ground penetrating radar works by transmitting electromagnetic energy in the form of radar waves into the ground using a device that is pulled across the ground surface by the researcher, we can see in that far left image. Um, and as you can see in the image on the, uh, the far left, when the wave encounters a different material in the soil, such as air voids, bone, or a material with different moisture content, a reflection occurs, sending part of the wave back up to the surface where it's recorded uh, by the device. The ground penetrating radar is really useful for detecting fractures and rock flakes and rock art conservation. It's good for identifying areas for targeted excavation is how we were using it and for, uh, and for identifying bedrock layers. So you know how deep your bedrock is uh, before you start excavating or coring. So you can see our colleague, Dr. Kelsey Lowe, there on the left pulling the device, uh, the ground penetrating radar device behind her. And using this, she's able to generate images like the one on the, on the right. She can then process the data from the device right there on site in about one to two hours. And so that's you can get a very quick idea in the field of what your subsurface uh, deposit looks like. So what you're seeing in the image on the right is areas where the radar waves have hit objects that have reflected the wave back up to the device on the surface. And so these are shown in red. So that's your high reflectance areas. And you immediately know you're probably looking at a big rock or some other object when you see that. The blue areas are regions below the surface with less rock and other objects. And it's those quieter areas in the imagery that you want to aim for if you're trying to core deeply at a site or place your excavation trench. So these are just some examples of sites from the project in Arnhem Land. Um, with the site plans overlain with the ground penetrating radar imagery. And so you can see in the top here, uh, if you are aiming to place your excavation square or your core, you would really want to focus in that dark blue area that's very quiet. And you'd really avoid on the right uh, that shows a lot of reflectance. And you can see um, the ground penetrating radar image uh, and the figure on the bottom is a very, very noisy site. Uh, there's a lot of big objects under the surface, so you'd have to think about how to place your, your excavation quite carefully there. These are just some more examples of the archaeological sites we mapped using ground penetrating radar over the course of a few days. And you can really see from these examples that the technique gives you a window below the ground. And you can see all the old land surfaces, rockfall and other debris, get an idea of how deep the deposit is in different areas of the sites. And you can get a clear idea about where to place cores and excavations. So the images on the left on this um, are the reflecting sig reflectance signals from the ground penetrating radar, basically from a side view. So the areas that look like ripples that are very noisy visually, uh, we want to avoid those and we want to focus on low wave areas for placing our cores. And you can see the location we chose for this shown in red on each one of those images. So basically Kelsey would target areas with very low reflection signals and um, would mark those on the ground for us. And we then we would then be able to target our coring locations. In this case, we were collecting sediment samples every 50 centimetres for optical dating of the sand sheets. So we could see how old, in, how old the sand sheets were at what depth um, and get an idea of any artifacts that were coming up as well. And that way we would know um, if it was worth returning to for excavation. So when those optical ages came back, we were able to see that we had a range of sites. Some of them were going back to 80,000. Some of them were last glacial maximum in age. So it really gave us a good idea of the age of, um, of those, those sites and sand sheets across that landscape. So during the course of my PhD, um, which I did with Dr. Satikna, he was one of my PhD supervisors. 
um, I undertook fieldwork to test this method in Indonesia. This work was done in collaboration with Arkanas, with Dr. Satikna, uh, Anton Ferdinando, and many other Indonesian colleagues. Our archaeological survey was done across large regions of the islands of Roti, West Timor, and Saram, with the goal to apply the rapid site prospection um, at known and newly identified archaeological sites. The aim was to rapidly assess the archaeological potential of as large a sample of sites as possible. And this approach meant that we could assess the potential of many archaeological sites across a region, meaning sites appropriate to a range of research questions could then be targeted in subsequent field seasons for excavation. So we would already have an idea of what we were finding at the sites and the age of them um, before we went in and did a large scale excavation. Today, I'm going to specifically talk about our research in Roti Island. Uh, so in 2018, we undertook a research program on the island and it was aimed at testing the rapid site prospection approach in Indonesia specifically with the goal to increase the pace of site exploration to find sites suitable for addressing questions about human occupation across the region. Field work was carried out in August 2018 to identify new archaeological sites and revisit sites already known to Dr. Satikna and colleagues. The study basically had four main objectives to assess the success of the new prospection approach in rapidly evaluating archaeological sites, to estimate the distribution of site establishment and use across Roti Island, and to assess the subsurface topography and depth of archaeological deposits, stratigraphic changes, presence or absence of cultural materials, the range of artifact types we were seeing at the sites, and if there was data or material uh, in many of the sites. We also wanted to identify sites suited to answering key questions about long-term cultural change, which can then be explored in future targeted excavations. So just briefly, the island of Roti is located in the Nusa Tenggara region of the Indonesian archipelago and forms part of the biogeographic region of Wallachia and is located about 12 kilometres southwest of the island of Timor. The islands overlain with uplisted coralline limestone and karst, with the underlying geology exposed across large regions of the northwest and southeast, and comprises formations rich in shale, mudstone, and shirt, which are all excellent for making stone tools. So this is just a satellite image of Roti Island with our eight survey regions shown in red, and the archaeological sites which were already known or were newly identified um, during our surveys shown in yellow. We spent three weeks of survey um, across the south central region of the island with the previous surveys by Jack Miko uh, focusing on the north central and western regions of the island. So we knew we'd already spent a lot of time working there, so we focused more towards the centre. The first sites we visited were located on the northwestern side of the island and were already known to Dr. Satikna and Arkanas and have been previously excavated by the Indonesian archaeologist Dr. Maherta. As we already knew quite a lot about these sites, they acted as a good test site for our method, as we could see if we could replicate the earlier findings. If we were able to replicate them, then we knew the rapid site prospection method was working well. And I'll discuss um, some of our findings from the sites later in this talk. Survey was focused on areas where a combination or all of the following criteria were present. We wanted to see that the underlying geology was exposed and people had access to abundant raw materials suitable for stone tool making. There was access to fresh water in the form of rivers and springs and the coastline was within foraging distance of the site, allowing access to marine resources due to the depauperate terrestrial fauna on the island. So just the images on the right show some of the sites that we found during our surveys on the southeast side of the island. Once we'd selected a region that contained all the required criteria, permission was sought from local landowners and officials to undertake research. And these images show some of the new sites that were located on the central and southeast side of the island, um, which is quite a rugged and still heavily forested region and also the high to highest topographic uh, region on Roti. So following survey, the previously excavated north central sites of Lua Miko and Pia Hadali and four of the sites located during the new surveys uh, were selected for our rapid site prospection and subsurface testing with the surface deposits first imaged using GPR, then cored and sampled over five days. 
One of the first sites uh, we investigated was Luamiko, which is located approximately four kilometres inland from the north central coast of Roti. And it forms part of a complex of sites identified in 1986 by a team from the Indonesian Archaeological Research Centre uh, in Jakarta. So this site is a small hill formed by an uplifted coral reef with five northwest facing rock shelters with abundant surface artifacts and several smaller southeast facing shelters. So two of these shelters were excavated by Maherta before 2003 and they yielded shallow deposits with terminal Pleistocene to mid Holocene occupation. At Luamiko, Maherta dug a two by one metre test pit and she excavated down to a depth of 70 centimetres and revealed five stratigraphic layers with artifacts occurring in all these units. And she obtained a radiocarbon age from the bottom dating to approximately 28,000 years ago. So on the site plan on the left, uh, you can see Maherta's excavation squares and you can see the overlaying uh, radar grid, which we laid out. Uh, so Dr. Lowe um, could perform her analysis and you can see an image of her there working with the Grand Penetrating Radar Machine. Uh, and the images that were generated from that, you can see on the bottom right there, those vivid images. Um, so you can see the area where Maherta excavated is actually visible in the GPR. It's that very noisy, very red region in the centre there. So we're actually picking up the disturbance from that earlier excavation. So that also allows you to make sure that you're not accidentally excavating where something previously has been, has been dug. And then we ended up choosing um, a quiet, deep part of the archaeological deposit that was close to the original excavations. So we could see if we could replicate the cultural and stratigraphic layers and ages uh, found by Maherta. So you can see the location of that, that core that we selected shown by that red and white um, circle in those bottom images. So these images are just some photos of the day showing our research team coring at Luamiko with the hand auger and collecting samples uh, with the whole process taking about an afternoon. The second site we visited was Pier Hidali, which is located two kilometres from Luamiko. And this is a complex of northeast facing rock shelters formed along the edge of an uplifted coral reef. This was also identified during the original 1986 survey and the sites adjacent to fertile agricultural fields with a permanent stream to the west and a large cave with a spring at the eastern end. So it's really well situated for people. So uh, a series of test pits were excavated in one of the rock shelters by Maherta, and they revealed a shallow cultural deposit underlain by limestone bedrock with occupation spanning the terminal Pleistocene. And what's interesting at this site is a Holocene record appeared to be almost entirely absent from within the rock shelter. We were again aiming to replicate the sequence found by Maherta, which would allow us to ground truth our rapid prospection method. Uh, you can see on the ground penetrating radar grid uh, and the subsurface imagery, the locations chosen for coring again, shown by those circles. Um, and we were able to core each of those locations down to the sloping limestone bedrock. So this image just shows some of the Indonesian students from Kupang uh, and our colleague uh, Agus receiving training with the ground penetrating radar at Pier Hidali on the day. So after we finished work on the northwest side of the island, we moved to new sites found during survey of the island on the southeast. One of these is the cave site of Lua Hina Lian, uh, which is a single chamber cave located at the southwestern end of the island. And it, it basically, it's in a, a large sunken depression in the surrounding landscape. Um, with a palm forest growing inside. And we found several stone artifacts um, on the surface outside the cave entrance and its nearest spring. So it seemed like a high potential site. Um, and you can see the ground penetrating radar guiding tapes laid out by Dr. Lowe. That's basically laid out in a grid within the cave. And then the GPR device is dragged in a sequential pattern to generate the subsurface imagery. Um, and you can see those amplitude slice maps of the deposit indicating a low reflection, so a dark blue area suitable for coring towards the rear of the cave. And then you can see in those images as well where you're getting those high reflectance red zones. That's probably flow stones uh, deeper down in the deposit that are kind of coming out from the cave wall. So you'd want to avoid those if you want to get a deep, deep penetration with your core. So two locations were chosen for augering. Um, and they reach depths of over two metres. 
and the deepest core we think likely hit bedrock as the base showed a lot of limestone rubble with very little sediment towards the bottom of the core. And again, we were able to do this entire process in the space of about half a day. So this is the last one I'll show you. Um, this is the South Central Cave site of Lewis Men, which is located in a deep and broad valley on the southern side of the island and was shown to the survey team by local landowners. Now this chamber was about 20 metres deep with a four metre ceiling and a flat sediment floor and it had a number of pottery sherds on the surface. So it also looked quite high potential. And the ground penetrating radar showed there was a lot of flowstone activity towards the bottom left of the grid. You can see it in those images again, those dark, bright red areas. But there were also some quiet and relatively deep areas towards the back of the cave that were chosen for coring. The deepest of the three cores reached about 2.5 metres, which was the depth that the ground penetrating radar signal began to fade out. That probably means that we're coming down onto bedrock. And these photos just show us on the day with the research team coring and collecting samples for later analysis. So once subsurface testing and sample collection had been completed, the samples were off to the lab for analysis to ascertain the presence or absence of cultural material, the soil geochemistry, if there was evidence for the use of fire, such as halves at the sites, and to undertake radiocarbon and optical dating to give us rangefinder ages for occupation at each site. So once we got the samples into the lab, what did we find? The four new sites found on survey all yielded evidence for occupation. For the site of Luahina Lian, which is um, our really large cave with the deep sediment trap, so initially looked really promising, we found microbone was present in the samples from over two metres depth to about 1.5 metres, um, with the deposit containing no cultural material below 1.5 metres. Charcoal was present in small quantities above 1.5 metres to the surface, and this coincided with a sudden increase in nitrogen values uh, shown by the soil chemistry. And this was interpreted by the team to be the introduction of some kind of faecal matter from this point. And we also see the gradual increase in the mag's magnetic susceptibility values. So you can see down the bottom there, um, that part of the figure, where you've got the bright red single line, that's our magnetic sus susceptibility value. And you can see that that's slowly starting to increase after 1.5 metres, and that occurs um, at, as charcoal appears in the site. And so that allows us to say probably the charcoal isn't being blown into the site from the environment, um, the fact that we can see burning in the sediment means it's probably that the charcoal is deriving from within the site um, from anthropogenic burning, people making fires. Um, what was also interesting, considering how promising the site had looked initially, was that when we dated the radiocarbon, um, it became clear that that entire deposit well over two metres, was only uh, several hundred years old. So occupation at Lua Hina Lian is really recent. So if you're interested in anything older than the last couple of hundred years, this tells you immediately that this is not the site to spend time and money excavating. The other site I'll mention here as a test case um, is Lua Nglana. Now this was a very, very different site to Lua Hinalian. Uh, this site is located on the central south of the island, about two kilometres from the coast. It's a small rock shelter formed by an isolated piece of uplifted limestone reef with a flat earth floor and abundant stone artifacts and marine shell. And they were both on the deposit surface and eroding out of the hill slope. Two of the locations were selected for augering within the shelter following ground penetrating radar. And the deepest of those only reached about 50 centimetres before encountering bedrock. So a very, very shallow site in comparison. Stone artefacts and marine shell occurred in all samples below 10 centimetres, with stone artefacts actually peaking at the base of the deposit right on bedrock. So you can see again that bright red line uh, down the bottom where all the graphs are, that's showing that we're getting a peak in our magnetic susceptibility, and that's occurring in samples where we're also suddenly seeing a peak in charcoal, which is the black line right down the end. So basically this again shows that we've got in situ burning within the rock shelter. There was also a lot of turban and um, top snails and triggerfish remains in the samples from the cores, which are frequently identified food resources in archaeological middens, which isn't surprising considering how close to the coast this site is. 
And despite the shallow deposit, we received a radiocarbon date on marine shell from the lowest sample of about 10,000 years BP, demonstrating early Holocene occupation of this small rock shelter. So this time, a very small rock shelter with a very shallow deposit, but with occupation spanning 10,000 years um, back into the early Holocene. So another surprise, and we would have known this without undertaking the rapid site prospection. We also had some surprising results uh, at Pier Hidali, which is a site excavated by Mahurta. And these results really demonstrated the usefulness of this set of methods for working out what's going ac on across a whole complex site. So in Mahurta's original excavation, which was undertaken quite close to the escarpment wall, so you can see that very top uh, left-hand image, those tiny little squares right near the purple uh, escarpment, they're the excavations and you can see our um, GPR test area, which is indicated by 2018. That's where we tested. Um, so Mahurta found three stratigraphic layers in her excavations, um, with the bedrock being very close to the surface at a maximum depth of about 75 centimetres. And she dated these shallow deposits uh, to terminal Pleistocene, and there was no evidence of Holocene occupation uh, within these test squares. But in the series of cores that we took at Pia Hidali, um, we moved quite a bit further sequentially out from the rock, fall, uh, the, rock, the rock wall. And we found four stratigraphic units in the core se sediment sample profiles. And interestingly, none of these actually match those identified in the nearby excavation. And what this suggests is that we've got um, a very heterogeneous sediment deposition across the site. So it's quite different in, in different parts of the site. The deepest, um, the deposit represents a cultural sequence, so those those deep sequences out the front of the site, and these had stone artefacts increasing with depth to about um, over two metres depth. We also see again peaks in the magnetic susceptibility values from our sediment samples that we took. So again, those red lines, they coincide with evidence for heating and burning at the site. So we see peaks in charcoal, burnt earth and heat shatter of the stone artefacts. What was also interesting is that marine shell was almost non-existent in the samples, and this contrasts very strongly with the nearby excavation where Mahurta found a large assemblage of both freshwater and marine shell. There was very little charcoal at this site, and that's also what Mahurta found in her excavation, um, but we were able to date a piece of charcoal from relatively close to the surface, and that basically returned a modern age at about 50 centimetres depth. As I said, we weren't able to replicate um, Mahurta's st stratigraphic or cultural sequence. We found something very different out the front of the rock shelters. And this in combination with the modern age on charcoal at 50 centimetres leads us to suspect the missing Holocene record for the site is actually to be found outside the rock shelter with the Pleistocene record preserved inside on those that shallow sloping bedrock as you come up to that um, to that back wall of the rock shelter. As I mentioned earlier, we also carried out rapid site prospection at the site of Luamico, and which was a site also excavated by Mahurta. And the rock shelter here has a shallow cultural deposit with a date of 28,000 at a depth of 60 centimetres on bedrock. As I said, using ground penetrating radar, we were able to identify a deep region of deposit close to the excavation, and we were able to core to a depth of 130 centimetres, so quite a bit deeper in that part of the site than the 60 centimetres where the excavation occurred. And when we analysed our samples back at the lab, we found the cultural sequence extended another 40 centimetres below that 60 centimetre depth, and we were able to replicate the stratigraphic layers found by Mahurta. And we obtained a radiocarbon age of about 30,000 years, also from a depth of 60 centimetres, very similar to that age of 28,000 years Mahurta found. And we're basically now waiting on our final radiocarbon results to see how old occupation in that lower 40 centimetres is. And basically, without this set of methods, we would not know that Lua Miko contained a deeper and potentially older cultural deposit. So all of this work is now written up for publication well, with Antoine and Dr. Thomas Satigna and many other Indonesian colleagues. And we're just waiting on those final radiocarbon ages, and then we should be able to submit So this brings me to the second part of this talk, which will be a focused on a new multi-author paper published in the journal Quaternary Science Reviews earlier this year uh, with Dr. Tristan Jones here next to me and Chris Clarkson. 
And this investigates the now drowned landscapes of the Sahul Northwest Continental Shelf, uh, which is now part of Northwest Australia. In this paper, I used very large high resolution bathymetric data sets, which is essentially a topographic map of the ocean floor to reconstruct the paleogeography of these now drowned landscapes that in the late Pleistocene were dry, habitable regions that people could walk around on. So the submerged uh, northwest shelf of Suhul was a vast area of land in the late Pleistocene that during times of lower sea level connected the Australian regions of the Kimberley and Arnhem Land. So they are those two areas you can see marked on the satellite imagery. And you can see the Joseph Barnapot Gulf is basically where, um, where that huge uh, now submerged region was once dry land that connected that whole area together. This part of the now submerged shelf extends about 500 kilometres northwest from the modern day Australian shoreline towards the island of Timor uh, with a now submerged landmass of about 400,000 square kilometres. So this is basically an area a 1.6 larger times larger than the United Kingdom or New Zealand. So we're talking about this massive landscape uh, that used to be part of Sahul, the Sahul continent, that just isn't there anymore. We already know Indigenous Australians were making use of the exposed continental shelves, uh, which you can see shown in grey in that figure, figure of New, uh, New Guinea and Australia, so a much, much larger uh, continental region in the deep past. And we've got archaeological evidence for late Pleistocene use of these landscapes demonstrated on multiple large islands that are remnant portions of the continental margin. So if you can see, it's a bit unclear on these slides, but there's white dots um, basically scattered around that periphery on that grey now submerged continental shelf that shows those regions where we have um, people living, living out there in the past when it was all dry land. So in this paper, we argue, along with others before us, that the exposed northwest shelf connecting the Kimberley and Arnhem land formed one vast cultural and biogeographic region. Evidence for an early shared cultural tradition across Northern Zohul takes three forms. So we have late Pleistocene axe technology found only in tropical North Australia and New Guinea from first occupation until the mid Holocene. So that's only found across that region. There's similarity in the early naturalistic rock art traditions represented by the irregular infill animal style in the Kimberley and the early large naturalistic fauna style in Arnhem Land, which is um, really tying into Dr. Tristan Jones' work. So examples of these are shown on the right. You can see how similar those two rock art styles actually are. And what we also find is this really distinct and highly diverse language family called non pamanoan language families. And that's spoken in both in the Kimberley and Arnhem Land today, with the majority of the rest of Australia dominated by the relatively homogeneous uh, Pamanungan language families. So we find this very ancient ground stone axe technology. Uh, we find these very similar rock art styles only found in those two regions. And we also find very le similar language languages in that area as well. So it's very different to the rest of Australia. So to visualize the history of sea level rise and fall on the Northwest shelf during the late Pleistocene, we projected past sea level curves onto the high resolution bathymetric data for Northern Australia. And I did this in ArcGIS Pro, which is a very powerful um, piece of GIS software for doing this sort of visualization and, and analysis. So for marine isotopes stage four and three, I used the New Guinean Huon Terrace sea level curve. And we have seismic data um, from mining activity across this part of the shelf that demonstrates that our coastlines in this region um, we're about negative 80 metres lower than today, which actually matches that curve from New Guinea really well. And so basically we know that we have this very low period of sea level, which you can see indicated by that black box on the sea level curve down to the left um, between about 70 to 61,000 years ago. So coming into this period of MIS-4, uh, you see that big fall in sea levels that you can see on the graph, again, demarcated by that box. Um, and during this time, as sea levels dropped really, really low, it exposed a vast sweeping archipelago off the northwest coast of Suhul for the first time in about 60 to 70,000 years. The archipelago, archipelago persisted for approximately 9,000 years, again, between about 70 to 61,000 years ago, and then it submerged 
uh, again in the second half of, of that time period. So this 9,000 year window of archipelago formation represents a best case maritime crossing window from the Wallachian Islands of Timor and Roti to the northwest shelf of Suhul. Um, if people crossed in this location, uh, this basically would have been the time for them to do it. The second period of major change occurred within the onset of marine isotopes stage three. So again, that's that period in, demarcated by that black box down the bottom there. And during this time, we see several rapid reversals in sea level, and that basically produce these high sand events. So we see a big increase in the height of our sea levels about 60,000 um, years ago and also between 52 and 49,000 years ago. And what we see then is almost full um, submergence of the London Derry and Sahul rises. So that big region uh, you can see shown on the map, that's all underwater, shown in pink. And we only see um, the archipelago of the Van Diemen rise persisting in the northeastern area. So you can see that little blue archipelago, that's basically all that's left at this time. So a human response to the dynamic environments of the Northwest Shelf during this time is potentially detectable in the archeological records of the adjoining Kimberley region shown here on the map. Uh, and you see a pulse in first occupation appearing in this region at four sites. So they're all shown in orange, Minjiwara, Wijingari, Carpenter's Gap and Riri. Um, and this really does follow on from that MIS-3 sea level high stand between 52 and 49,000 years ago. So it's possible that what we're actually seeing in Australia at this time is the onset of occupation across the Kimberley following this event. And that's representing human populations retreating inland in response to extensive marine flooding of the shelf at this time. The third major period of change occurred with the termination of marine isotope stage three and the onset of stage two, which resulted in a regional fall to greater than negative 120 metres uh, relative sea level across this whole landscape at the peak of the last glacial maximum. Now this produced a broad, fully exposed terrestrial shelf with a range of diverse environments and the high resolution bathymetric data available to us for this region meant that we were really able to start zooming in and working out what those environments in the past might have actually looked like. So when sea levels fell, this gigantic inland sea called the Melita Sea formed in that intra-shelf basin. So you can see that big pink area um, that's basically the size and range of that inland sea. Um, and it was basically almost completely landlocked with just a marine connection to the open ocean through the Melita Valley, which is that huge feature that stretches upward and connects you to the Indian Ocean. So the Melita Sea existed in this form from approximately 27 to 17,000 years ago. So we have this stable 10,000 year window where we have this gigantic inland sea uh, in the middle of this landscape. And what our results also allowed us to do was establish that this, the, the shape and the size of this inland sea are very, very similar to the Sea of Marmara in Turkey uh, on the boundary between Europe and Asia. So that's that photo on the right there. So if we're looking for a modern analogy for this landscape, that's probably one of the best. So in this slide, we really begin to see the usefulness of the high resolution bathymetric ocean floor maps for reconstructing ancient now drowned landscapes in Australia and other parts of the world. In the detailed bathymetric data, we can see the complex topography of the northwest to northeast Bonaparte Basin is really dominated by the deeply incised flat topped plateaus of the London Derry, Sahul and Van Diemen rises. Uh, and these basically almost completely encircle uh, that inland Melita Basin. So you would have had these big escarpment regions circling that inland sea. Now these escarpment regions were able to see from the bathymetric data um, contain many massive gorge and valley systems. Um, and in some cases, these gorges and valleys are connected to paleo channels. So ancient submerged river systems, uh, which used to once drain the continental shelf into these gorges. And you can see one of the largest example of these in the bathymetric data to the right. So that deep purple region is 
um, the really deep part of that gorge, which is over 200 metres, and you've got these very, very steep sides that you can see. So we're able to really zoom in and get an idea of, you know, what these landscapes might have looked like in the past using these data sets. What you can also see along the bottom there um, are transects for several of the gorge systems shown at the bottom. So this basically means that within the ArcGIS software, you can demarcate a line across the landscape that you're interested in, and that will then generate that topographic profile. So you can see, you know, from the side where you might have undulations across the landscape and gorges and river systems. So many of these gorges and valley systems contain deep areas where fresh water could have pooled and you find that we can see in the bathymetric data that there's paleo channels draining into the gorge systems um, visible in the bathymetric data and I'll give you some examples of those in a moment. Uh, and these basically we can see from this that these catchments had the potential to form freshwater reservoirs kind of like those that we see in Arnhem Land and the Kimberley today. And that this occurred, the largest gorges of the Van Diemen Rise, which is that high elevation blue area in that map. These essentially would have created a series of freshwater refugia across the landscape about 100 kilometres from one another. So we can already see from this that this region would have been well watered. Uh, so people would have been able to, to basically be living out there and surviving. The closest regional um, analogy that we have, so the closest modern example for the submerged gorges of the Northwest Shelf are probably Death Adder Gorge and East Alligator Gorge in the Arnhem Land Plateau. And I briefly mentioned some work we did in Arnhem Land right at the beginning of this talk. And I was able to directly compare the ancient submerged landscape shown in the bathymetric data with the topographic digital elevation maps that are also all available for Arnhem Land. So you can see one of those in the top left um, of the escarpment region. So those very light blue areas are very high and then the pink is showing you deep areas. So basically uh, the edge of the escarpment there. So you can also see the transect data. Um, so again, taking a line across that, bath that bathymetric or topographic data. So we can actually start to see incisions and, and features across that landscape. And then by directly comparing these transect data sets, it was possible to demonstrate that the drowned Northwest Shelf Gorge systems probably looked very similar to the examples of these gorges in Arnhem Land, um, pictures of which you can actually see on the right. So it begins to allow us to imagine what this now completely drowned and lost landscape might have looked like in the past. One of the ways the gorge systems out on the northwest shelf might have been replenished with fresh water is through the paleo channels that we can um, clearly see visible in the high resolution bathymetric data across the broad sloping plain that comprise much of the southwestern to southeastern half of the Bonaparte Basin. So basically you can see those channel systems uh, which now form part of the ocean floor, uh, but once upon a time they would have been big, large freshwater systems with water running through them into some of those gorges, um, making this a very dynamic and habitable landscape. So um, we've got published sediment core data, and that shows that these continental rivers remained active throughout marine isotope stage two. So during that period where we have that massive inland sea and this whole region is exposed, um, we know from our, from our core data that those rivers are actually flowing at this time. Using also using the bathymetric data in the GIS software, we can directly measure the length, width and depth of the drowned river systems. So we can begin to really get our, an idea around the size um, and distribution of these big features. Um, and they range basically inside from river systems that are two kilometres wide um, down to little tiny river systems that you can see in that central top end, which that might only be 100 metres wide. So we can get a really high resolution detailed view of this landscape. We can also use the high resolution bathymetric data to discover ancient landscape features that aren't necessarily visible very easily anymore. So the one I want to discuss is an isolated sub-basin or depression to the southwest of our big Melita intercontinental sea. And this was identified as a potential catchment area back in 2001 and then it was never really uh, explored further. So the depression, uh, which you can see indicated on this left left hand map by the white irregular circle, that's basically our depression catchment area. Um, it's located about 30 kilometers north 
of the modern day Kimberley coastline and it has a catchment area of more than 12,000 kilometres squared. So this very, very large potential system. And basically once sea levels dropped below the negative 80 metre contour, we could see within our within the ArcGIS software on these high resolution maps that the depression um, very likely became isolated from the marine environment of that big inland sea between about 30,000 years ago to 14,000 years ago. So we have this stable landscape period of about 16,000 years. So because the topography of the basin means even river channels as far west uh, as the Paleo Mitchell Lawley River. So you can see on the map all of those blue river channels that are flowing in. Basically, because of the topography of this landscape, we can see that those rivers very likely flowed towards that sub basin uh, and very likely fed a very large freshwater lake. So we really hadn't known this about this region before, but if uh, it begins to make us think quite differently about that Kimberley landscape if there's actually a gigantic lake that's sitting out not very far now from the modern coastline. So probably a very important um, landscape for people in the deep past. And uh, you can, as I said, you can see that the potential maximum extent of that lake is shown by that white contour line in that image. And so if this lake became completely filled, it would have had almost twice the surface area of Lake Toba in Sumatra. So we're talking about a very, very large lake. The existence of such a lake uh, for approximately 16,000 years in marine isotope stage two could have sustained a large freshwater ecosystem. And if this is the case, such an environment would have important implications for past human habit habitation of this region are potentially focusing human subsistence activities around the lake, which is actually off our current coastline. So it's quite possible that humans were actually concentrated out in this region that's now completely underwater at the height of the last glacial maximum. Um, and what's interesting is that if we look at the archaeological record of the Kimberley during the last glacial, we actually see a, a, a very large decrease uh, in the number of archaeological sites that are being established by people at this time. Um, so it's quite possible that the presence of a very productive, large freshwater lake environment to the north of the region actually drew people out of the Kimberley region into this area. Um, and we, we find across Australia that retreating to well-watered regions like this during the height of the last glacial is actually really common. So it's not a surprising pattern that we're finding here. So this slide here, this is the work of Corey Bradshaw and Fred Soltre, and they're, um, they're really amazing modelling modellers who came onto this project. And they're essentially using hindcast earth system models, so big scale earth system models that they project back into the past to estimate the potential carrying capacity of the landscape. So this is basically expressed um, in the number of people that the Northwest Shelf was capable of supporting. So the data doesn't tell us how many people were there, but it does tell us the number of people that that landscape actually could have fed and supported and that could have lived out there. So we can see from the graphic on the left that potential carrying capacity declines with the descent into marine isotope stage four. Um, we get a big increase in potential, the potential number of people during marine isotope stage three. Um, and during this time, the site, the potentially this Northwest Shelf region could have supported uh, between half a million people. It's also worth noting here that these models function, they're like a useful heuristic. So they give us an idea of how many people might have been out on the shelf. We're not saying that these are real world population numbers, but they tell us again how many people potentially lived out there. And what's quite interesting about this graphic is if you look at the graph in MIS2, we get this very big um, high peak in potential carrying capacity, which we were quite surprised to see, but it's probably due to the fact that the Northwest Shelf is fully exposed at this time. So we have maximum land availability for people. And just recently there was a big uh, paper published in Nature and that demonstrated um, that in the Tiwi Islands, which is a region very close to the Northwest Shelf, we were seeing a big increase in population numbers during the height of the last glacial. So that genetic data bore out the modeling study uh, really beautifully. So we know that there was a range of diverse and dynamic environments out on the Northwest Shelf were able to rework the paleogeography um, using all of our bathymetric data sets. 
We know that the region could have supported a substantial population from our modelling and the new genetic data. Um, so this has profound implications for the impact of sea level rise coming out of that last glacial when we start to see, you know, the ice caps start melting again, sea level height around the world really starts to increase. And what we see at this time is very extensive flooding of, of, that, um, of that landscape. So it begins to submerge again. So again, using the high resolution bathymetric data within the ArcGIS software, I could project past sea level curves onto the data. And this allowed me to work out uh, how much land area was drowned by the rising ocean um, in 500 year intervals. And from this, it could be seen that following a rise in global sea levels at the termination of the last glacial maximum, the Northwest Shelf experienced two periods of especially rapid sea level rise. The first occurred um, at about 14,000 years ago during what's known as Meltwater Pulse 1A. And during this time, sea levels rose between four to five metres per hundred years. And this resulted in over 100,000 kilometres of land being drowned in the space of a 400 year period. So if you look at these two maps over to the right, that top one, that whole red area went underwater in 400 years. So that's 100,000 kilometres of land just basically vanishing essentially in the space of human lifespan. So people would have been able to actually see the landscape um, changing almost before their eyes during their lifespan. Um, so this would, been, would have been an incredibly dynamic environmental time to be living in basically. The second more protracted period of rapid sea level rise spans between 12 to 9,000 years ago with the onset of the Holocene. And we see um, repeated rapid pulses in sea level at this time. And that drowned another 100,000 square kilometers of land. So that's that huge red zone you can see shown in that second map below. And this occurred in the space of a 3,000 year interval. So slower this time, but again, you're seeing this incredible amount of land lost uh, within this space of time. Now, what's really interesting is archeologically, these two periods of accelerated sea level rise register as a pulse in occupational intensity in archaeological sites in both the Kimberley and Darnham land. Uh, and we interpret this to reflect an influx of people being pushed ahead of that rapidly encroaching coastline. So you can see um, all the graphs on the far right here. Uh, you can see that they correspond to peaks in the number of artifacts that are being deposited in sites. So we see a big increase in artifact deposition occurring in the same time periods that we're seeing these huge areas of land go underwater. So we're interpreting that to mean populations are being pushed back ahead of the, that, um, that encroaching coastline and people, large numbers of people are suddenly appearing and using uh, at these sites and using them. We also see um, at these time periods the emergence of new and very distinctive rock art styles in both the Kimberley and Western Arnhem Land. And this is a particular specialty of Tristan Jones. Um, but yeah, basically it looks like suddenly these, these new dynamic um, styles of rock art appear at the same time in this landscape as we're seeing this huge drowning of that northwest shelf. So just in conclusion, uh, the Northwest Shelf was a very large habitable landscape that connected the now separated ancient archaeological landscapes of the Kimberley and Arnhem Land. The Northwest Shelf contained a mosaic of habitable fresh and saltwater environments right the way through from marine isotopes to like stage four um, to the, the termination of the landscape basically as we come into the Holocene and we're able to work all of this out using our high resolution bathymetric data sets so it allows us to revisualize those ancient landscapes. Um, Modelling reveals the drowned shelf could have supported between 50 to half a million people at various times and we see that our rapid sea level rise, rise coincides with a noticeable increase in stone artifact discard at archaeological sites and as I said the emergence of new rock art styles across this landscape. So this is just my last slide. Um, so essentially this image doesn't show part of our, our previous publication but it does show the same period of sea level rise following the end of the last glacial maximum uh, for Sunderland and you can see the northwest shelf of Suhul down in the bottom right of that large map so you can see a really uh, huge area of land is drowned 
um, between 15 and 14,000 years ago. That's that blue region. And you can see the same areas that are impacted at that time on Sunderland. So it's having a, a lesser impact 14 to 15, 13,000 years ago uh, on Sunderland than it is in Sahul. But what we can see is there's actually a very huge and rapid drowning of Sunderland between about 11 and, and 9,000 years ago. Um, so this follows several thousand years after the Sahul Northwest Shelf was drowned. Um, we see this staggered, huge loss of land, uh, of land uh, through this adjoining continent. So something I'm very interested in is whether we can see the same patterns we're seeing in the archaeological and rock art record in Sahul also happening in Sunderland. Are we seeing big populations in the late Pleistocene being pushed back ahead of rising sea levels? Uh, and, and that's really something that I'd love to investigate with, uh, with the Archaeometry Centre and Dr Satikna and Antoine into the future. Uh, and that's just about it for me. Thank you very much, everybody, for today and your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Cassie. Uh, it's a very nice uh, map, yeah, for the construction. Right, so, and uh, we still have more or less like 20 minutes before we have a short break. So if you, there's any question from people who attend face-to-face -face here, or uh, there is one question from Zoom. Ada pertanyaan sedikit satu dulu dari ini. Ini the very short question. I think, a, I think uh, what kind of a projection that you use for reconstruction of this map? Uh, and how high is the resolution are the best to do the reconstruction? Yes, yeah, so within the ArcGIS software, it uses a global projection system um, that's basically worked out by the computer. So that, that basically means that everything is projected as it should be and you're not getting um, you're not getting distortions of your data. So the ArcGIS software takes care of that for you. Um, the resolution of the bathymetric data for Sunderland, it's the, the big GEBCO data sets um, that, that are freely available for anyone to download. Um, unfortunately, the resolution is not very high in this data set. So the pixels are about a kilometre by a kilometre. So you're not going to get the same resolution with this data set that you're getting in the bathymetric data that's currently available for Sahul um, in that particular region. Those pixel sizes are about 30 metres by 30 metres. So that, that means essentially that we can really zoom in on that data and we can begin to see those finer features like the paleo channels. Um, it would be wonderful if into the future, and Dr Satikna was talking about this, if some high-resolution bathymetric data became available uh, for this, this area of Sunderland, and then we could really begin to look at that paleo geography in more detail. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other question? Yeah, Bill. Thank you very much. I would like to ask about how do you how did you make a difference uh, to differentiate between the saturated sediment and unsaturated sediment in the cave during your GPR analysis? Is it any difference on the on the what you imaging you receive from your uh, field work? Thank you. Uh, with the GPR imagery, um, that analysis was undertaken by Dr. Lowe, but my understanding is that the, the radar wave um, is impacted to some degree by saturation of the sediment, but it's also impacted by the type of sediment that the wave is having to travel through. Um, so one of the reasons that we wanted to actually try using ground penetrating radar in Indonesia was to see how well the technology coped with these very different environments, like these sort of very clay rich, um, high moisture content cave environments compared to what we were using it for in um, in Australia, which is these very well-drained sand sheets. Um, so we weren't sure how the GPR was going to perform, um, but it ended up performing really, really well. So it gave us a very good idea of what we were seeing in those cave sites. And we were able to core through very rubbly cave deposit and get quite deep with our cores as a result.
to uh, uh yes please i, I did see. I would like to ask uh, how to find the high potential uh, location for human activity in the submerged landscape uh, from the bathymetric or your analysis. Um, well, I think really where the value of the bathymetric data comes in is that those landscapes are no longer accessible to us. And what can happen, of course, is that when you can't see a landscape anymore, you tend to really forget that it was a landscape that was used by people that connected regions that we think aren't connected um, and so it allows you to think large scale about the different landscapes that people in the past were interacting with compared to the landscapes we're interacting with today um, and so I think it's just a way to really broaden your imagination um, and really think about you know people in the past were living in a very very different world to what they are today the depth of the ocean um, across that northwest shelf region it's more than 100 metres deep, the water there. Um, and you've also got, you know, a lot of crocodiles and wildlife as well. So there's the potential in the future for people to do submerged archaeology, definitely. Um, but I think with the depth of the water and the very strong currents and the wildlife in this region, it's going to be quite challenging. You are seeing people... Um, some Australian archaeologists now beginning to work close to the coastlines on that submerged landscape and they're beginning to find archaeological sites like stone scatters. That's my second question actually, yeah. what's your opinion about that? Because there's a lot of controversy I heard about the finding of the stone still in that area, right? Yes, I mean um, when you're looking at surface scatters definitely things like uh, your tides and currents do have the potential to move artifacts around on the seafloor. Um, but I think the work that's being done is establishing that those artifacts probably were left out there by people on that submerged landscape surface. Um, they're doing really excellent work. I think that whole team, and I think it's really exciting to begin to see that we do have submerged archaeology on this shelf. And that really isn't unusual. Um, you have very extensive submerged archaeological landscapes on these 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 same sort of shelves all around the world in places particularly like Doggerland in that big submerged region between England and Europe. Uh, so we know that people are out on these shelves, they're using them, they're leaving artifacts behind. And so finding, you know, this exact same thing in Australia is really unusual. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Wow. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, Gassi. Hi, Jetmi. Hi, uh, Chris. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Gassi, I just... Uh, can you show me about uh, distribution of KF and Atrote? Yeah. Actually, uh, the contact here with, with the human location. Yes? Yes. Oh, sorry. Could you just ask me the question again? I didn't quite understand. Uh, Correlation with human occupation, I think. Yep. Okay. And that's the cave in Atrote. Yep, the Luamico. No, I I think uh, you can tell me about the distribution when when you remember with the uh, survey at Rote. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, map. Like map it. Just pull oh, it. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, this map, I've got a slightly closer one showing all the. For the excavation. Oh, age. Just tell me when to stop. Yep. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, um, I mean, a lot of these sites were found by you. Yeah, yeah, yes. So those sites are shown um, in grey. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, you've already done a lot of work surveying um, that that's, uh, our southern western side of the island. Um, so it was really amazing to be able to draw on, on your published literature about that. That was super helpful. Um, and you can see those two uh, black dots on the, the north side of the island. They're obviously Maherda's two locations that we revisited. And then those orange dots show the distribution of new archaeological sites that we found uh, during survey. Um, does that answer your question? No, no more. Okay, oh. thank you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Any other question?
maybe in five minutes, Pak Thomas, probably. Ya, terima kasih Mas Anton. Ini biar diskusinya tambah rame. Nah, semua orang sudah banyak bicara tentang paleo geografi. Oke, okay, kasih. Thank you so much for your terrific and comprehensive presentation today. Thank yeah, you. very, very appreciated. Uh, everyone already asking about the paleo and paleo geography, I think, yeah, and modelings that. Uh, I would like to ask, or actually just want to confirmation. Yes, we know that uh, optically stimulated uh, luminescence is one of reliable dating methods for archaeology because uh, based on the sediment samples mm -hmm. that can be found in every archaeological site here. However, every areas has different composition in term of mineralogy. That's right? Yes. Yeah. And in this regard, and piece of your experience as archaeologist and also as geochronologist, yeah. Uh, which is the most uh, preference or uh, the preference most for OSL sample? Uh, contents more feldspar? or contains small uh, quartz. And, and how both, both works for archaeology. This one, OK? Oh, I have to, sorry, I just want. And maybe uh, the other archaeologists have the similar question with me. Maybe uh, this good for our young archaeologists here. And the second is uh, what we did in Kupang, Rote, and also the last one in Seram is the most advanced uh, survey uh, technique. Uh, we brought everywhere with the heavy, heavy hand augers, and we always, always get it, uh, sample from that. And we can strike away, know about the anthropogenic or with the OSL dating, mm -hmm. strike away. Mm -hmm. Then after from this, very quick uh, survey, we able to choose where is the uh, where is the best best site to be for the exactly. So that the uh, the tricky question is the tricky question is uh, how to minimize any potential contamination for OSL dating and also for anthropogenic analysis on the sample, uh, which is collecting collecting using the uh, the hand auger, an auger yeah. or even with machinery uh, coring devices mm -hmm. because it is very important mm -hmm. especially when we work uh, working on the uh, tropical area like in Indonesia yes okay excellent. thank you Kasi. thank you <laughs> excellent questions um I'll address your second one first so one of the reasons that we did go back to Maherta's original sites where we did know the age and the stratigraphy well um, was to actually make sure that the hand augering wasn't having an impact on our ability to uh, to actually replicate those sequences in a way that wasn't churning the sediments too much or contaminating. And um, particularly at Luwamika, we were really able to demonstrate that we were successfully able to replicate that stratigraphic sequence. We were able to obtain ages that were very similar to Maherta's at the same depth. Um, Essentially, the hand auger is not the ideal way to collect these samples. With the OSL samples that we were taking, we would stop at 50 centimetre increments and we would collect a light sealed OSL tube. And so we already knew that in those there's no contamination. Um, and often artifacts would actually be contained within the tube. So that was also a way every 50 centimetres to make sure you had a very intact deposit. Um, but what I'd really like to do in the future uh, is to use a proper mechanised corer that has a complete sealed tube inside of it. And what that essentially allows us to do is to remove a completely undisturbed and intact deposit within that tube. And then you can, you can wrap it up, you can take it back to your lab and you can actually open it up in the lab and perform what essentially is a micro excavation in your lab environment. Now that's really the best case ideal way to do this. And it's the way I want to do it into the future. Um, 
Yeah, so so basically the work that we've done on Roti, we were able to show that it does work. You can get an enormous amount of data out of just small sediment samples collected from those those open auger um, test sites. Uh, but in the future, really, the way to do it will be to do it with mechanised cores that are sealed so you can go much, much deeper in your deposit uh, and get these beautifully intact sequences as well, um, still in that very low destructive and rapid manner. Does that answer your second question? Yep. Yeah. Okay. With the first question, um, it really depends on if your if your preference is feldspar or quartz. It really depends on the ge the sort of the geology um, of the islands you're working on. So with roti, um, because it actually forms part of the the Australian continental shelf, um, there's actually quite a bit of sand and quartz on this island um, and very little feldspar. So it was more similar to the sort of geological environment that um, optical dating people have to deal with in Australia. Um, also on Saram, there was quite a bit of quartz. Um, yeah, so they, you know, that, that actually worked quite well uh, for dating. But of course, you know, for most of Indonesia, as you know, we were talking about earlier, it really is feldspar that you're reliant on. You don't get your quartz. Um, yeah, so you need to, to to basically, and that's one of the things that's very, very useful about this coring method is that you're able to quickly get those samples back to the lab. And so you'll know before you ever excavate a site what your dating options actually are. Are you Do you have charcoal in your deposit? Um, are you only going to have feldspars? Is there quartz? So you can be very prepared and actually get the right specialists in to work with before you uh, you begin those excavations. So again, it just allows you to really plan ahead, really make sure that you're going to be able to date your site, uh, how you're going to need to do it. Um, yeah, so it's just another useful way to, to go about this. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Is there any question? I think there's two questions uh, in Zoom meeting chat. Uh, one is from Alifa. Uh, it's in Bahasa with any. Uh, for the coring method, how you anticipate this? Uh, considering the coring, it's only like how many centimeters, like maybe two or three or five centimeters, something like that. And how you interpret what is inside the cave based on the coring. And in terms of dating, paleoecological artifacts, uh, cultures, and then is there any specific a uh, uh, things that you need to consider when you uh, I don't know uh, when you want to core in the in, in certain site I mean the, what is your uh, justification I mean I want to drill in this part of the cave I want to drill in that part of the cave that thing that's, yeah. That's right. yeah, yeah so yeah. Our, our coring location is very much guided by that ground penetrating radar imagery um, so we're able to go in there, take a couple of hours, get all that subsurface imagery visualised, and then we can work out from that where, so that gives us our justification of where to core in the cave, essentially. We can go, okay, we can see from our risk reflectance profiles that this part of the cave is very deep. Uh, it's also relatively clear of all the rock rubble, um, and so it allows us to choose our locations very carefully um, to, to try and obtain maximum depth and data retention from those cores. Um, does that answer that question fully? Yeah. 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 Just okay. Kidding. Thank you. Uh, another question. I think uh, from Agung from RC from Limnology and Water Resource from Bryn. I have several questions. First, uh, you said that there are three areas that you use to take data from field work in Indonesia, which is Roti, Timor, and Saram. Do you have any specific justification why did you choose those areas? Uh, the second question is my. Uh, it's about Lake Kimberley in Australia. Do you think the environment change in that lake mostly affected by anthropogenic factors and why? Yeah. Uh, the first question, the reason that we chose to work in Roti, West Timor and Saram is we were really interested in seeing if we could use this rapid site prospection technique to pick up uh, very early evidence for occupation. So we were essentially wanting to get into these islands um, undertake those initial surveys, do that initial rapid site prospection, then go back and excavate. We did get our uh, several years of initial surveys and coring studies completed, and then the COVID-19 um, pandemic unfortunately halted 
all subsequent research. But the, the choice of those islands is because they're basically gateway islands uh, that people would have had to move through if they were coming across a northern or southern route um, through Malaysia uh, to that massive Sahul continent. And so we basically targeted those islands because once we began to look at the, you know, the dispersal modelling, it became clear that it's very likely that if people went that way, they moved through those islands. So, yeah, so they're, they're basically bottleneck or gateway islands. Um, so that that it basically guided the choice of, of those island locations for us to work in. Um, for your second question with Lake Kimberley, it's very likely, considering um, its location and how large it was, and that it probably was a very, very large freshwater region during that potentially drier period in the last glacial maximum, that it was an anthropogenic landscape. Um, it's very, very likely, because we don't see very many sites being established to the south of the lake in the Kimberley region, which is still above water today, we still may see like a decrease in population in many regions um, across the Kimberley, it's quite likely that people are actually being drawn out away from the Kimberley towards that massive lake system. And um, so that that's probably where occupation, anthropogenic activity was being concentrated in the last glacial. Um, and so, of course, that means that that archaeological record is essentially lost to us now. It's very deep underwater. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, probably last question, if you guys still have any question or maybe something to say about Cassie presentation. If not, we're going to have a short break and we'll be come back at 11 sharp. Thank you very much.
Oke, okay, uh, selamat siang. Uh, kita akan lanjutkan sesi berikutnya. Uh, next speaker will be Professor Chris Clarkson. He's a professor of social science at the University of Queensland. And he's a well-respected archaeologist and an outstanding researcher among Lutetian. For many years, he's been working all over the world, Australia, South Africa, Europe, India, and now he's like closing to Indonesia, hopefully. And <laughs> for sure in Australia also. And for many years, he's been working all over and how to understand human dispersal, adaptation, and technological evolution from Stone Tools perspective. So, and he's been awarded numerous awards. It's very plenty mouthful to say that one. But anyway, uh, currently he's a research project working on modern human arrival and and complexity in Australia and Southeast Asia. He's been published numerous publication. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's more than 100s, if not <laughs> Mistaken, and presenting his work as a keynote speaker in national global seminar numerous occasion. So it's such an honor to have you here. And uh, thank you for kindly sharing a bit of your knowledge with us here. And without further ado, I invite you to present your presentation. Thank you very much, Anton. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here, and thanks very much for having me. Uh, sorry about that echo. I'm not sure what we can do about that. Do you know we can... another microphone turned on somewhere? A bit better? It's still pretty echoey. Okay. Maybe that one there is picking it up. Is that better? No. No. It's, it must be another a microphone somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'll keep going, and maybe you can sort it out as we go along. Uh, hopefully, no one starts to feel a bit strange with that echo the whole time. Yes. Okay, so I'll share my screen. There we are. Okay, how do I get rid of that bit on the side? Oh, but I want to see them. Okay. What happened? Okay. Right, okay, let's begin. So uh, I understand some of you in the room are quite experienced or even experts in lithic analysis, so please excuse me if I uh, cover things you already know very well or, uh, you know, I, hope, I certainly don't mean to talk down to you, but I'll try and uh, cover some basic things about stone artifacts as well. And then I'll talk more about the, um, the nature of, of human dispersal. Uh, okay. Oh, that might be it. Yes, okay. Mute the mic. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is that better? No, uh, yeah, that's a bit better. Okay, great. Terrific. Thanks for that. Okay, now, yep. Okay, so let's get on with things. Uh, oh, what's that every time? I don't know what's happening there. Okay, sorry about this technical hitch. We'll get this sorted in just a second. Sambil menunggu, uh, nanti mungkin setelah ini sesinya kita ada workshop, ada sedikit tentang, kita akan coba praktek untuk produksi alat batu. Jadi di depan kita bisa lihat ada beberapa alat batu yang sudah di display. Jadi mungkin nanti saat kita break makan siang, uh, bisa sambil lihat-lihat, bisa sambil nanti tanya-tanya di sini bagaimana uh, untuk uh, beberapa anatomi untuk masalah uh, nanti yang materi yang diberikan oleh Chris seperti itu. Jadi uh, saat makan siang kalau bisa nggak kemana-mana dulu kalau emang ada makan siang silakan makan siang kalau yang 
sedang puasa bisa di sini dulu sambil bisa lihat-lihat uh, materi yang kita sudah siapkan di depan. Seperti itu. Everything good, Chris? You need a new laptop, probably. <laughs> Okay, I think we're ready to start again. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Sharing? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Now it's working, I think. Oh, good, Chris. Okay, thanks for today. <laughs> uh, what can stone artifacts tell us about the past? I'm sure we all have many ideas about this already, but I'll quickly. Oh, okay, yeah. The share screen is the, the other one. Click. Oh. What do we want to do? Oh, well, it's just sharing now. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so what can stone artifacts tell us about the past? Uh, how are stone tools made? I'm sure you have already tried this, but we're actually going to have a little bit of a practical demonstration at the end as well. I'll make some stone tools and you'll get to make a few things as well. Uh, what fracture features are important? And this is actually important to know because when we go to analyze a collection of stone tools, we could just measure everything and record everything, but it can be a bit of a waste of our time. So it's better to have targeted approach where we actually know what attributes we're interested in to measure the right things, to record the right things. And particularly in places like uh, Indonesia, Island Southeast Asia, sometimes we have not typological assemblages, points and backed artifacts and those kinds of things, but often we don't. We have just flakes and cores. And if we just said how many flakes and cores there are, we would see no change through time. So it's important then to do the technology to actually pick up subtle changes in things like shape, the way platforms are prepared, the use of technologies like bipolar, the way cores are prepared and so on. So I'll go through some examples once we've 
gone through the basics of how stone tools are made uh, and show some examples of how I've, I've at least done this. And I'm not an expert in Indonesian stone artifacts by any means. I've, I've worked in Timor, but that's really it as far as Indonesia. I've worked mainly in Australia, Africa, and other parts of the world. But I've seen enough stone tools from around the world to kind of know, you know how, how to analyze them and, and to recognize all the types that are there. But I defer to experts in the room who know more about this than me. And I'll talk a bit about raw materials. Again, you've probably touched on this already in your studies or, or in your own work. Uh, but what raw materials are super, su uh, uh, um, suitable for stone flaking? And then I'll talk a bit about my own uh, my own work, I guess, and my own interests, and that is the out of Africa story. So I know, of course, that stone tools here were made by hominins going back million, you know, million or more years. Uh, but I won't talk so much about that early stuff. I'll more talk about this question of how do we recognize the first anatomically modern humans moving into this region? And it's a really difficult uh, process because, you know, sometimes not a lot of change in typology. There might only be things like changes in raw materials, but maybe there's more subtle things happening that we can detect as well. And then uh, my own work in Australia, does that contribute to this um, argument or this debate as well. Are there things happening in Australia that are unique or that somehow reflect on what we see in um, Indonesia? And then I'll talk finally about uh, what I gather is important about the Indonesian region as a crucial stepping stone and an crucial region of human evolution in its own right. So I'll talk about some of the diversity that we know of that's here uh, and some examples from a little bit of my own work. And then after the break, we'll do some stone tool mapping. Um, I'll demonstrate some things and then you'll have a go at making some things too. So why do we measure, why do we uh, look at stone tools at all? What can they tell us about the past? Yep. Uh, well, they can tell. <laughs> okay. Um, we can work out what period uh, we're looking at based on some of the typologies and some of the artifact types that we find in our sites. We can, of course, look at what activities were carried out at a site. Um, sometimes function can be, or the type of the type of the artifact can be indicative of function, but often not. So typically we need to look at the edges, look at where and the residues and so on that we find on the artifacts. How intensively were sites used? And Kashi just talked about uh, when we have people moving back in off the shelf in Australia, we can see these peaks in artifacts that are being dropped at the site. That's telling us the intensity with people with, with, pe with which people are occupying the site. So when we get these big fluctuations in how many artifacts are being discarded or left behind at a site, that's probably telling us how much time people are spending there, how much flaking they're doing at the site, uh, how much they're occupying the site. So it can be really useful for that. And often there's no other way really to do that. You know, in a lot of sites, things like charcoal don't survive very well. Fauna may not survive very well. The artifacts are the most durable, so they give us all sorts of insights. How were different parts of a site used? Uh, and so Kashi also gave a good example of that as well. That in a rock shelter, there may be an area that's not as old or maybe used up at the back, up at the front of the rock shelter. We might see a different occupation sequence or different type of use. What was the nature of the prehistoric trade and exchange? And the more we know about the raw materials in particular, the more we can understand where they've come from, how they've been transported across the landscape, how they've been shaped, reused, and passed down the line. Also, of course, this informs us maybe about interaction between groups, migration or ideas transferring between groups, uh, things like, you know, we were just talking in the break about things like these beautiful bifacial points. Where do they come from? Are they an are they, are they an indigenous origin just on, say, one island, or do they show a flow of ideas that may have be a result of migration or trade or interaction? So lots of great things we can explore there. How and when do technologies change? And of course, that's a really key way of looking back into the past and saying how are things like climate and um, faunal turnover and sea level rise and so on, how have these things affected people living in the landscape? And we know they had profound Change, uh, profound effects. And surprisingly, stone tools, which just look like little lumps of stone in the ground, they're incredibly sensitive to this sort of change in how people are living their lifestyles. So I think above all, technology gives us that glimpse into how people are coping with change, responding to change. And of course, that helps us also to think about what's next in our own society. We know that change was constant in the past, and particularly in response to things like big climate change. Well, what have we got ahead of us? 
huge climate changes, sea level rises, people may not be able to inhabit regions they've used in the past. So even though it's not the same scale and they're not the same way of living, you know, that glimpse back into the past at least helps us to think about, okay, how do we respond to these sorts of things? Uh, and finally, were people sedentary or mobile to differing degrees? Another big question, particularly throughout human evolution, as we know, societies settle down, they become more sedentary, maybe they start to grow crops, crops or raise an, uh, herd animals. Or um, So we know that changes that happen in stone tools as this takes place as well. New types might appear that reflect new activities like forest clearance or housing building, uh, as well as where people got their raw materials from. They're not traveling so far, so now they maybe use more local raw materials. And they might also change the way they're making their stone tools. Maybe they're not making so much you know, fine hunting equipment. Now they're just knocking off a simple flake uh, to, to cut up some things or making maybe more agricultural tools. So um, this big change in sedentariness also. Stone tools can be very informative about that. We know that um, our understanding of stone tools kind of only slowly emerged. So, you know, at the end of uh, maybe two, 300 years ago, uh, archaeology wasn't yet a discipline. And of course, in large parts of the world, or, or at least in some parts of the world, people were still making stone tools. So early uh, antiquarians, dilettantes, historians, archaeologists started to become interested in how stone tools were made. But in places like Europe, stone tools hadn't been made for thousands of years, so they really had no idea. They thought that things like little Neolithic arrowheads that were being found in sites were actually the result of elves shooting arrows, so, you know, mythical creatures, or um, lightning strikes on the ground, leaving behind a beautiful hand axe. So they really had no idea that humans had this very long antiquity and that we made stone tools all the way back. And so early uh, archaeologists started to become interested in things like um, the Brandon gunflint manufacturers. These weren't stone tools as we think of prehistoric people using them. They were made for um, creating a spark on a, on a um, musket. So, but by studying what people were doing, you could start to see the recognizable signs. Ah, this is a human made tool. We see a bulb of percussion, we see a platform. Uh, we can see that you can change the elongation and the shape of the tools by manipulating the core in certain ways. And this became even um, more clear to archaeology and to early anthropologists and ethnographers when they started to encounter indigenous people through the you know very sad and tragic and and uh, exploitative process of colonization but as a consequence it brought mainly european archaeologists at this point in time into contact with indigenous people still making and using stone tools so we began to understand for the first time the different kinds of uses the, and also maybe the lengthy processes that people went through to get stone and to shape it. Sometimes incredibly high levels of skill involved in stone. And that of course, these skills were lost to Europeans. So they had to relearn them. They either had to experiment or they had to study and learn from indigenous people. And even to this day, there are still some people alive uh, who have either seen stone tools being made, for instance, in Northern Australia, where I work, people know their grandparents still made stone axes and used um, chip stone. In places like New Guinea, uh, there are still people making stone tools to this day. Uh, but yeah, we've learned a, a lot throughout that process. It was a slowly emerging science, if you like. And it really only became more scientific process in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, as archaeologists began to experiment with making stone tools themselves, uh, try to relearn the lost arts that they were of stone making that they saw in places like Europe and Asia, and also began to understand things like the mechanics of fracture by using things like physics. Uh, just some more examples of, of uh, early demonstrations of Indigenous people using stone tools in Australia. And one of the things I guess I also would just point out that from studying Indigenous people, it also became clear that not every stone tool that people were using was shaped in a specific way. They didn't have a knife that was in the shape of a knife. They didn't have a, a point that was in the shape of a point or a saw that had a saw edge. They used a wide variety of stone flakes for almost all tasks. And I think this is very relevant when we think about Island Southeast Asia in particular, where we also see the same kinds of technologies, simple flakes, um, retouch on the edges, but not in a fully stylized or formalistic way. That doesn't mean that those stone tools are simple or that they couldn't perform all the tasks people needed. 
they were able to you know do everything and to live their lives with quite apparently simple stone tools so I think that's been a really valuable lesson to take away from uh, indigenous people as well but then of course we know that um, around the world you know tremendously complex and skillful forms of stone tools did appear uh, sometimes in response to uh, new challenges sometimes uh, as a way of uh, expressing status and that you're an elite person. So, for instance, if we look at the uh, these beautiful Danish daggers, and I've got an example up at the front here you can come and have a look at later. They've been pressure flaked, ground, punched out with a, a special punch. They've been um, manufactured in such a way as to copy metal daggers, even down to the stitching on the handle. Uh, so we know that stone tools initially, when metals first appeared, didn't just disappear straight away. They were still very, very useful. The ancient Egyptians, they were still using stone arrowheads, even though they had metal. Uh, in um, Bronze Age parts of Europe, they were still making their sledges, their Neolithic sledges, using stone insets, as you can see on one of these boards here. Uh, the first um, uh, clay using, metal using people to enter Britain, for instance, like the Amesbury archer, you may have heard of him had both copper tools, but also still had a lot of stone tools on his possession. And of course, most famous of all, probably Utzi, the ice man, the, the ice mummy that was found in the Tyrolean Alps in Austria, uh, had both a copper ax and a, a large suite of stone tools. So that process of stone tools dropping out of the record uh, was a slow one and indicates that stone tools were valuable to people, even though other metals and other materials were becoming available. And to this day, you know, you've probably heard about the obsidian scalpels being used for eye surgery. So even to this day, we've kind of recreated some of the old stone tool use for a new and modern purpose. In terms of human evolution, of course, we know that stone tools have been made for at least 3.3 million years in Africa, at the site of Lamequi in East Africa. We don't know what species made those, but they were not homo, they were not us, or, or even on our current lineage. They were probably an Australopithecine or a robust Australopithecine known as Paranthropus. And a, quite a few different species were living in East Africa at the time. And the stone tools that they made in many ways resemble the kinds of early activities that we might think that uh, these early hominins may have been engaged in, like cracking nuts on, a, on an anvil. In the process, some flakes popped off. They probably quickly realized that they could smash stone on an anvil in this way. And technologies like bipolar, where you put a small piece of stone on an anvil and crush it, we find those technologies right back to three and a half million years ago. And, you know, paleoanthropologists are saying probably it actually goes back much further still. Because if we look at our close living primate cousins, they also make and use tools of the various kinds. And our last common ancestor with them was probably six to 10 million years ago. So who knows, maybe stone tools go all the way back to our last common ancestor or, or before. And of course, we know over time, stone tools get more complex. Uh, we find by the older one, uh, early homo are starting to manipulate cores to solve problems, to use the core to make the biggest flake available, uh, to, to extend the life of the core by flaking it in, in new ways. And then of course, by a million years ago, we see the beautiful hand axes being appear, uh, uh, manufactured for the first time in, in Africa. And examples of which we've got uh, an Indonesian hand axe on the table up at the front you can look at as well. So that hand axe technology, some people have said, actually, if we were to think about what tool best represents humanity in all of its existence on earth, it would have to be the hand axe because it was made in exactly the same way for a million years. What other tool can we say was made for a million years in the same way? Exactly the same shape, exactly the same form. So, you know, it is probably the best. If we were to rep represent ourselves to aliens, we wouldn't be showing them mobile phones and tools. It would be, uh, you know, a hand axe. And then, of course, through time, it gets more and more complex. We have prepared core technology appearing by about half a million years ago. So Lavalois shaped points, uh, lots more retouch, the first appearance of things like glues to halved stone tools onto handles and so on. And then by the last 100,000 years, of course, a proliferation of new types. Every, every kind of conceivable type is being made. Beautiful little backed tools, microliths that are, are glued onto handles, uh, projectile points of myriad kinds, grindstones now for, for grinding up hard to eat foods like seeds and grasses and so on. Ground edge tools are starting to appear. 
uh, a little bit later on, but by, say, 65,000 years ago. And new systematic technologies like making the same kind of tool one after another off the block of stone, so blade production. Whack, whack, whack. One blade, the next one exactly the same, one after another. And new technologies like pressure really starting to appear for the first time. Pressure flaking, where you push the flakes off. So, you know, it's an amazing story, the, the growth and proliferation of stone tools. We've really, really not got to the bottom of that story. And particularly in places like Indonesia and Australia, where the pattern is not so clear. It doesn't necessarily follow, it. in some ways it does, of course, we have the early lower Paleolithic hand axes and uh, cleavers, so that part of the story matches. But then as we move through time, we see a diversity of different responses to the way people are living in the world, making different stone tools. It's not like we have a clear upper Paleolithic and, and the same progression of types takes place here. People are doing things differently. And I think that's the great story that we, we take away from the last 50, 100,000 years is that humans are responding in different ways. They're not just making the same hand axe anymore. They're doing different things in different places, all equally complex, all adapted to their local environment. And what we want to do as archaeologists is to tell that story, not to just look to Europe and say, the same thing must be happening here. It's not, it's not the way it was. And Australia is a good example as well. We don't see the European sequence or even the mainland Asian sequence. It's totally different. So as the next generation of archaeologists, you know, I hope you'll go out there and try and find the local patterns. Don't worry about what's happening in Europe. Some things will look the same, some things won't. But yeah. it's a local story, and that's what, that's what we're trying to tell. And, of course, we find stone artefacts in so many different kinds of sites, as you know, when we're surveying artefacts are everywhere. And because they're kind of almost indestructible, really, Wherever humans and, and their ancestors have lived in the past and left stone behind, it's there pretty much forevermore. It's um, the best calling card we can think of for our very, very distant um, ancestors. And we find them, of course, building up in caves, middens on the coast, open scatters, and they all present different problems. So open scatters can be wonderful because we can see the big assemblage. Everything is there, the core, the hammerstone, all the artifacts lying around. Whereas when we dig in caves, yes, we have the fine layers building up, but often we're just looking in that little hole. So we're not seeing the spatial arrangement so well. So that gives us a different lens on what's happening in the past. And, you know, recently I was in Arabia doing some archaeology and that was fantastic because there was, I mean, as I'm sure you can appreciate, you walk around in Indonesia, there's going to be jungle, there's going to be, you know, it's hard to see the ground. But in Arabia, there is not even a blade of grass. All the artifacts are there on the surface. So for me, that was like I died and gone to heaven. All the artifacts were there to see wherever I walked. And uh, they were beautiful artifacts too. But, you know, for us, in, in areas where there's heavy vegetation, we've, we've got no choice but to excavate and to look in caves and to look in exposures where there's erosion because we can't see the artifacts beneath the ground. If we could, if we had X-ray vision, we would see billions upon billions upon billions of artifacts wherever we looked. Underneath these buildings right now, there would be artifacts. You know, out on the landscape, under the sea, everywhere. Everywhere humans have lived, there are artifacts. And once you know what to look for and you get your eye in, uh, you know, you can't help but see them. And we often talk about assemblages, just to kind of put the word out there. I'm sure you've heard it before, but it just means a collection of stone artifacts from a context. It could be an open site, it could be a layer in a, in a cave or whatever. So if you hear me using that word, you know what it means. Okay, so I don't want to labour anything too long because we've only got limited time, but how are stone, tool fact, stone tools made? And I'm sure you've covered this already, but uh, fracture mechanics, it's the physics of how stone, brittle stone fractures. And not, not all stone tools are made from brittle stone. Some can be made from soft stones that are pecked or ground or whatever. But for the most part, throughout most of prehistory, we're talking about flaked stone. Ground technologies don't really appear until much later. Uh, so flake and core features, what are they? I'm sure you know them, but we'll cover them quickly. And the different flaking techniques that people used in the past. And this is interesting because uh, just recently, uh, Ruli and his colleague Alifa and others uh, published this paper showing a new technology on the island, um, the Kangian Islands, where the punch technology is being used. Um, you know, you need to know what to look for to identify those sorts of technologies. And you know, it's not always just core and hammer. Sometimes there's pressure, sometimes there's punch. And when we find those, those sorts of techniques, it opens up a whole new window on why. Why would they use this technique? It's more elaborate, it's more complex. 
it's hard to answer that question. Okay, so fraction mechanics. The beauty of stone tools, unlike culture, culture changes all the time. The way people think, feel, what they do, it changes constantly. But fracture is the same, always. Uh, so when we see a stone tool and we see the marks on it, you know, the, the, the scars and the initiations, the terminations, we can go straight into the mind of the person who made that because we know what they did. They, they hit this rock in this particular way and this flake came off in this particular way and left these marks. And there's no other way you can do that. Unless you're getting confused with Ecofax, but that's a different story, and I'll cover that in a second. So the same actions made the same flakes. Uh, also, stone sources, so where the stone comes from in the landscape, that's also going to likely be in much the same places in the past as it is today. There will be some movement, and some things will be covered up and under the sea and so on, but for the most part, if we know where stone comes from, we can use that then as an anchor point into the past to understand how things are being moved around, how people moved around, and what sort of stone they had access to. So knowing where stone sources are today helps us understand mobility, how people traveled, how they traded, what good stone they had, what bad stone they had, and how did they respond to those. So as I said, most of the flaking that we see in archeological sites is the fracture of brittle solids. So what brittle solids do we see around us right now? Things like glass. Glass is everywhere. It's the same thing. It's silica made from melted sand with other additives. Well, most of what we find when we see flaked stone will be silica or silica-rich stone. It doesn't have to just be saying things like chert and flint. It can be volcanics, but typically they also have high silica content, and that's what makes them good to flake. And so when we crack a stone, we're trying to drive some mass, some material off the block. And it doesn't just crumble off, of course, we're opening, opening the stone by opening a crack and then accelerating that material away. So we're, we're causing the crack to um, propagate, to shear away from the block of stone and then fall off. And that process of conchoidal fracture, as it's often called, leaves these distinctive features, which I'm sure you've all um, heard about before. The Hertzian cone, the conchoidal bulb of percussion. And to control fracture, uh, there's the two main interacting features. There's the platform, so how far in you strike from the edge. If you strike all the way in from the edge, you need to strike the stone very, very hard, and maybe a flake won't come off at all. But if you strike close to the edge, it's much easier to get a flake off, and you've probably done this yourself when you've tried to flake. If you pick up a stone, big block of stone, you hit it in the middle, nothing happens. If you hit near the edge, you're more likely to initiate that fracture, propagate it. And I'll talk about why that is in a second. And of course, we see different kinds of initiations, and they're very telling as to how people have been making the stone tools. So when we find, for instance, the Hertzian cone, so this little cone of force here, and the bulb of percussion and the ripples and so on, that's indicating a direct strike onto the platform, usually with a hard sort of substance, like a hard hammer stone. Sometimes, though, we see something different, and a lot of archeologists don't recognize these features um, well enough, in my opinion. So things like bending initiation, a bending initiation is where you get a distinctive lip on the edge, and that results in basically the flake snapping off. So rather than being impacted and a crack forming, the crack now forms by uh, bending initiate by bending forces. So it's like if you um, got a piece of uh, plastic or wood or something and you bent it, bent it, bent it until it couldn't resist the force anymore, it would snap. And you might see a bending initiation on on even chocolate can flake. Did you know that? If you have cold pieces of chocolate, I encourage you to go out and get some chocolate after this, put it in the freezer or the fridge, make it really cold and see if you can flake it. It, it does actually flake and you'll see conchoidal fracture on it and then you can eat it afterwards as well. Uh, and the other one, of course, is the wedging initiation, the crushed initiation. Very, very important when people are striking right on the edge, they'll often crush the platforms or when they're uh, supporting the nucleus or the stone, on another material and crushing it from above. So that wedging initiation is what we see commonly in things like bipolar technology, which isn't a mental illness. Well, it is as well. But in this case, it's a way of imparting force from two directions into the core, from the anvil up and from the hammerstone from below. And that basically drives particles of matter into the stone, forcing apart the two halves and wedging it open. So those are the basic kind of fracture initiations. And I have examples of all of these up on the table if you want to brush up on that. Uh, 
Sometimes you can even get both. So uh, we just talked about punch blades, for instance. They're a classic example where you get a little bulb of percussion and a lip. So that when you get those two things together and the really nice smooth fracture planes and some other features I'll talk about later, you know that you've, you've used a punch, you've used indirect percussion. And then of course, when force leaves the core, it does so in many different ways. The ultimate one that we're always looking for is the feather, uh, the nice, soft, smooth finish to the flake, a bit like lying on a feather bed, it's nice and comfortable. Same idea with the, the flake, it comes gently to the end and flakes off. That gives you the nice sharp end on the flake. But sometimes if we don't have enough power, and I'll talk a little bit about the interactions of force variables in a second, but if we hit the stone with not enough force, we might get a crack, but the flake doesn't go, the, the fracture doesn't go all the way to the end. So we don't get that nice feather termination. It falls out early and we get that an abrupt termination, a step termination. And step terminations are bad, okay? They are, <laughs> whenever someone's flaking a core and they get a step termination, you can always hear them go, Argh. Annoying because when you get one step termination, if you keep flaking in the same spot, you'll get another one and another one and another one. And that is what often results in the platform, that top flat part of the core being exhausted. You can't use it anymore. You need to do something different on the core at that point. Uh, so if you get hinges, another one. So that same idea, you hit the stone with not quite enough force and the force rolls out and it gives you a hinge termination. I've got some excellent examples of terminations up there. Big step, big hinge. Same problem, the force, if you strike in the same place, can't get past that hinge or step termination. It stops at that same spot. So when you're doing things like very fine manufacture, trying to make beautiful blades or trying to make beautiful um, points that are bifacially flaked, steps and hinges are the pits because you can't get past them. But there are some ways around them. Okay, so those are some examples. And the plunging termination, that's where you're too much force this time. The flake goes underneath the bottom of the core takes the whole bottom of the core off. Also extremely annoying in many cases because you might've had a nice big long core that you've been flaking and taking nice long flakes off. Now you take a plunging, takes off the whole bottom of the core. Now your core is only that long instead of that long. So it uh, chuck it away or do something else with it. But sometimes the plunging termination can be really informative because sometimes we see on the bottom end, so here you can see on the bottom end, this is the thick bit on the bottom of the flake there is an old platform there, an old area that people have flaked in the past. And it tells us then, ah, what did that platform look like? What angle did they have on the platform? What direction were the flake scars coming off? How were they preparing it? So it can actually be sometimes a bit of a boon to find a plunging termination. And of course, as we know, uh, we, can, we can think about staging this process. So the block of stone, the nucleus, doesn't have any scars on it. It's not anything, it's not a core. Then we take a flake off it and we get a negative scar. So that's that's the important thing. No positive bulb of percussion, nothing that sticks out. It's the footprint, right? It's the, if you walk on a beach and you leave the footprint, it's the negative imprint of your foot. Same thing on the core, it's just the negative scar that's left behind. So, you know, some people are very hard on this and they say, you can never have a core if it ever has a positive bulb of percussion on it. Others say, we can relax the rules a little bit because sometimes we know big flakes were used like a core to make other big flakes from. So technically, they would be called retouch flakes. That's the technical level. But we can still think about them as being flake providers, as, as being used like a core. And then once we've got the flake, of course, we uh, can do various things with it. We could just use it and throw it away. Or sometimes we might it might get dull while we're using it, and we want to resharpen it. And in the process, we make a new series of flake scars around the edge called retouch. And there's many different ways we can do that. Or maybe we're trying to shape it. Uh, maybe we're trying to shape the base of it so it can fit in a handle better. Maybe we're trying to shape it to a point so it is an effective weapon. Or give it a steep edge so it can scrape wood or hard materials like bone better or a notch. So these are the many reasons that people retouched flakes in the past was to shape them, to half them onto a handle, to make functional edges that are suited to the task. And of course, in all of this process, if you've ever done flaking before, as you'll see in a moment, whenever you make you know one nice flake that you are looking for, there's a hundred little bits and pieces left behind. And of course, whenever people are flaking in sites, all of that debris, sometimes it's called debitage, French word, just meaning debris basically, uh, you know, it all builds up and it's left behind. And some of it's big, some of it's small, 
So whenever we see flakes, we shouldn't immediately think, oh, they were definitely the desired end product. This is what people were trying to make. It could just be the haphazard leftover unintentional debris from flaking, including the core might just get thrown away as well. And, you know, people get obsessed with this sort of thing about what was the intended end product. It's, it's very hard to know. In some cases, even people have refit the core, put all of the pieces back on the core. And at the end, there's a cavity left. And they like, that is the desired end product. This is what they took away from the site. But I've heard other cases where someone's done that. And then next year they found the outflake as well. And they put that on and it wasn't the intended end product. So, you know, you can get, you can get yourself in a muddle. Uh, okay, the platform, as I mentioned briefly, is the striking, the area that you strike to make the flake. And it can have many different forms, and I've got lots of examples up there as well. It can have cortex. It can be a nice weathered, uh, sorry, a nice fresh flake scar. It can have lots of flake scars if you're faceting it or preparing it or turning the core. It can have a combination of those things. And often you'll find it's a heat break as well. People don't often recognize this, but stone is often heated um, deliberately or unintentionally in fire to improve the flaking qualities. It, it, it chips more easily with less force. The flake scars are finer and straighter and the bulb is smaller and ultimately it's a bit sharper as well. So heating is a common way and sometimes flakes, uh, blocks of stone were just thrown into the fire and the, the rock would explode and you'll get all these shattered lumps. But when it cools down and gets left for a while, sometimes that's the stone that people picked up and flaked later on. And you'll see the platform sometimes has this lumpy, crenated, um, pitted surface. And that often is a heat break. So it's a good thing to look for. Okay, how do we make big flakes versus small flakes? It's a bit of Dibble, Harold Dibble stuff here. Um, the two important variables are the angle on the core, the edge angle, the exterior platform angle, and the platform thickness. And there's almost nothing else involved in how big, in making a it's you have to balance those two things. So let's just think about these two shapes. Here is a thin shape. It's got a low edge angle, right? It's probably about 45 degrees. And if we were to strike this thin edge here at the, this point one, that's our platform thickness of one, we can see that this line indicates how big the flake would be that came off and it's tiny, right? And there's no way around that. You cannot fix that. So if you strike close to the edge of a thin flake, you will get a tiny artifact. So the only way you can make that flake bigger is to increase your platform thickness. So you strike four or five. You can see in each case, the flake is getting bigger, but it's still not that big. So how do we make overall the flake bigger? And the way we do that is to increase platform thickness. Sorry, sorry platform angle. So now we have a steeper um, high exterior platform angle, say about 75 degrees, and that's very common on cores. Now you can see at point one, just because of that higher edge angle, the flake is already twice as long as the one from point one on the thin core. And likewise, up to up to point five, very long flake. Now there's only one problem in all of this, and that is to strike further in each time and every time you increase the platform angle, those two variables mean you have to hit it harder and harder. So a, a steep edge angle and striking at 0.5, big blow. You're not gonna have to hit, hit it really hard. And you can do that in two ways. You can swing faster and harder, or you can use a bigger, heavier hammer. And those are the sorts of things that prehistoric you know, artisans, stone tool makers, they balance those two things. Do I want a long flake? Okay, well, do I hit it faster or do I get a bigger hammer stone? And hammer stones, as a result, were often very valued. You'll often find that in archeological sites, there are no hammer stones. Now, is that because they used an organic hammerstone, like a piece of wood or a piece of bone, maybe? Or is it also because it was valuable and they took it with them, and took it away? You'll find the hammerstone flakes. You'll find battered edges of hammerstones, often, but not the hammerstones themselves. Bit of an interesting thing. Do you agree? Yeah, they're often not there. And I think it is because they're valuable. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not always commonly available in the landscape. You might have to go to a special place to get them, like a riverbed, to get a nice cobble that's hard and dense, and heavy. Uh, so they hold on to hammerstones. The other thing is, if you the hammerstone size is important because if you get a small hammerstone, you're gonna have to swing it very fast and hard to get the flake off the edge, especially the bigger flake. And that means you might miss. It's hard to hit something when you're going really fast. So slowing it down a bit's important. So a bigger hammerstone might be important. Secondly, if you strike too fast and too hard, 
uh, the flake might crack in half. It could either crack in half through the middle or it could crack in half along its length. So it could be longitudinal or transverse, okay? And these are the features. I'm sure you've seen these many times before. I did actually provide a handout. Has everyone got a copy of that, like a email or something? Yeah. And it, these features are on there, but I'm sure you've you've you know you've covered these in class as well. So I won't go through them in detail here. But you know, ring crack, cone of force, bulb of force. If you want to see these features in very very fine detail, up at the front there, you can see a big black object, and that's a beautiful big obsidian flake. And obsidian shows all of those fracture features like in perfect um, verisimilitude. It's, it's like you can see it so clearly. So if you want to see things like fissures, for instance, they can be hard to see on a piece of chert or quartzite. It's just not there, rarely there. But on obsidian, it's every one of them is so clear to see. And the ripples, they're not just muted ones. They're huge ripples. So anyway, go and have a look at that during the break and you'll see. Um, again, I don't think I need to cover all these in, in great detail, but, you know, we have different features on the dorsal surface to the ventral surface. And of course, when we, and the ventral just means the tummy and the dorsal means the back. So the tummy is the, is the fresh fracture surface that comes off the core and it's got the bulb, percussion, aurelia scar and so on. But on the dorsal surface, you might find cortex. So the old weathered surface, you'll find the old scars from previous flaking and their direction and size and nature tells you about how the core was flaked before the flake came off. You'll find things like how the platform was treated and prepared. So you'll see, did they facet the platform? And faceting is where you just, you know, finely shape it with little tiny flake scars. Or did they remove the overhang from the previous blow, that little lip that's left after every, and I'll demonstrate this later on so you can see these, these if you haven't seen them in, in action before. Uh, so yeah, they, they tell us different things. The ventral surface tells us maybe how hard and how hard the hammer was. So you'll have a big bulb of percussion and lots of ripples. But the dorsal surface tells us about, you know, how late in the stage of reduction did this flake come off? Is all the cortex gone or is some cortex still there? How did they prepare the core? Did they prepare the platform carefully? What about the arrangement of flake scars? Are they all parallel, unidirectional, or are they centripetal or bidirectional? So those are the sorts of features that we study on our flakes and cores to understand, you know, the technology. And the same with core, negative scars only in the strictest definition. Um, and you'll get all of the negative footprints, all the imprints left behind from the previous flakes. You'll see the old platform preparation. You'll see if they've rotated the core at some point to make a new platform. You'll see what types of scars came off. Are they long and elongate or are they short and wide? Do they have lots of step terminations? Which of course, as I said, means that that core is running into trouble. They're getting too many step terminations. It's too hard to fix. They might throw that core away at that point. So this would be a classic example. Uh, what they often call a horse hoof core in Australia. It's got the big flat platform on top so you can flake all the way around that platform easily. Not, not really any faceting or scarring on that platform, but around the outside, lots of overhang removal, lots of negative scars and probably most Importantly here, lots of these big step and hinge terminations. So that core was basically wrecked. You couldn't really get big scars off that anymore without doing something to fix it. And of course, negative scars can come from all different directions. You can have cores that have scars coming from lots of different platforms. And we call these rotating cores or multi-platform cores. And learning to read your core means learning to understand how many different platforms are on that core the directions of those flake scars. Did they prepare them? Were the platforms big or small? What about the overall size of the core? Was it a tiny thing that had been used right up or was it a big thing with lots of cortex? So cores really, really important. They give us probably um, one of the best views, I think, of the overall technology that was used at the site, even more so than a flake. Because you can pick up a flake and go, oh, it's got some scars and platform, but I don't really know what technology produced it. Like, you know, you could be tricked. Oh, this looks like a blade. This is blade technology. But then you look at the core and it looks like that. And you're like, that's not a blade core. So you need to see the cores as well as to understand that technology. And the same goes with retouch. Uh, we study retouch in quite a lot of detail in our technology because uh, first of all, as I said, it, it gives us an indication of shaping gives us an indication of reuse. So you've probably heard the term curating. A stone 
is a limited supply, right? You have to go and get new stone if you use it up. If it gets too small, you can't make big flakes anymore. So often to extend the supply, to keep it going for longer, people would retouch it. They would reshape it. They would resharpen it. And of course, that leaves lots of debris. And there's lots of different ways you can do it. You can just take a series of flake scars off the edge that might be quite steep, not very invasive. Or you can carefully prepare the piece so that you can make long invasive flake scars come off it. And again, I'll show you later on in my demonstration how you do those two things. A short marginal flake versus a longer, thinner invasive one. Because there's quite a lot of technique involved in that. And of course, in the past, people discovered that technique and became masters of it beyond really anything anyone can make alive today sometimes. And the retouch, of course, gives you the opportunity to make vast, diverse array of different forms. And, you know, prehistoric archaeologists, not archaeologists from prehistory, but people, archaeologists who study prehistory can get confused because they might see the same shape, you know, in different parts of the world or different parts of the times in the past and they think there must be a direct connection but we know from studying archaeology now for hundreds of years that this isn't necessarily the case people sometimes rediscover these patterns again and again and again and a really classic example of that would be these little backed microliths backed artifacts it's a technology that people just discovered again and again and again different parts of the world it comes and then it goes away again and then over here they discover it and they use it for a while then they get rid of it same with things like points. You know, we think of points as being uh, spearheads or arrowheads. Yeah, sometimes they are, or maybe even most of the time. But other times they're knives, other times they're drills, uh, scrapers even. It's a multi-purpose tool. So retouch can lead us down a rabbit hole. We can think, ah, oh, it's all formal technology. The shape is what they used it for. It's got a notch, therefore it was for spoke shaving. It's not not necessarily the case. We have to do more study or, you know, or that there's a connection. Oh, this must come from Europe or it must come from over there. It's not, it's not like that. You need to do the local, the local sequence and understand the function also using things like use wear, residues on the edge to understand function. Can't just do it from shape. And you can have combinations, notches, serrated edges, steep retouch, shallow retouch, all on the same piece. And of course that throws up problems if we want to describe a piece like that. What do we call it? Is it, a, is it a notch? Is it a saw? Is it a serrated edge tool? Is it a rock? <laughs> you know, it could be anything. So um, again, and when people look at those edges under the microscope, often they do find that there are different uses on different parts of the tool and that they may have been resharpened and reused differently over time. And also platform preparation. So I'll, I'll be doing a bit of a a demonstration of platform preparation when I make do some flaking later. The, the two main techniques that you've probably heard of are overhang removal. So let, I've got a little diagram here of overhang removal. And what we're talking about here is little flake scars that come off the edge to five minutes left. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Well, we can talk a little bit after lunch as well. Yeah. I go on for too long. Sorry. Um, so you can prepare the platforms in different ways. And of course, you've got ground and peck tools, not something I'll talk so much on today. Um, do we need to stop? Yeah. Um, so you can peck in grooves, you can grind them in different ways. And, you know, we need to be aware that uh, things like grindstones exist in the, in the archaeological record, and people don't always pick them up. There's a lot of grinding, but you've got to look carefully to find it. Okay, why don't I stop there then? And I'll, I'll talk about out of Africa and Southeast Asia after the break. Yep. Thank you. Hey, we'll continue after uh, lunch break, uh, uh, probably one hour from now. So we'll continue at one o'clock and we'll be back here continuing your presentation. And afterwards, we're going to have a yeah, things to look at, and then we, we might go outside and then try to, like, napping some snow. Thank you very much. See you in, in a bit.
Hello, uh, good day. So we're continuing about the presentation that that we heard this morning. So anyway. Thank you. Uh, there was a bit more in there I was going to present, but I talked too long, so I'll skip ahead a little bit. And we'll just go to the stone tools out of Africa, Southeast Asia, and then we'll do some flaking. So as you know, uh, my interest, and I think it's a big interest here in Indonesia well, as well, is when did people get here? How did they move through? Did they leave an archaeological signature in terms of their stone tools and other kinds of behavior? And this question, I think, is still a hard one to answer because we have some very early uh, evidence of modern humans from places like Lida Ayer and, of course, in Australia at 65,000 years ago um, and in Arabia. And also some early signs that modern humans were in Greece and Israel by maybe even 200,000 years ago. So the whole question of who was where and when is very difficult now to solve. But we also know that at about 50,000 years ago, lots of evidence of modern humans everywhere. So were there two dispersals, one dispersal? What did they look like? We don't know. But that's one of the things we're trying, trying to work through. So uh, on this little genetics map here you can see you know some of the thinking about how this might have happened and of course it's always changing any genetics map you look at each couple of years it's different because they're always finding new things ancient dna and so on and also trying to incorporate archaeology and genetics can be quite difficult so you know when did people Okay, you can see, yeah. So, I mean, if we just summarize that, we can see that there's all these evidence, all this evidence of early modern humans outside of Africa, uh, you know, in Greece, in um, uh, Israel, in China, in Arabia, India, Lida Aya, Tampaling, Southeast Asia, and then Australia. And that pattern does still look older in the West and younger in the East, but who knows? I mean, maybe we'll turn out in China, that there's modern humans there even earlier still, we don't know yet, or in or in Southeast Asia. So there's lots of work to do. And, you know, there's been also a question about did modern humans bring a very distinctive stone toolkit with them, or is it something not so distinctive or no pattern at all? And that's something that as a stone tool person, I'm trying to resolve a little bit. So about, you know, 10 years ago, people like Paul Mellars, who's now passed away, but he was strongly a Cambridge professor, strongly pushing for an upper Paleolithic signal for modern humans. Backed artifacts, blades, um, engraved ochre, shell beads, and so on. And yes, we do get backed artifacts in different places at different times, but we don't see a single migration from Africa through to Indonesia that we could clearly say is a microblade technology. Myself and others have put forward the view that maybe it wasn't a backed artifact up a Paleolithic, microlithic technology, but maybe something more like what we see in East Africa, Middle Stone Age, what they call Mode 3, so prepared core technology, maybe with things like bifacial or unifacial points, um, Lavalois, discoidal technologies, but evolving along the, pro along the chain. So not just one technology from A to B or A to Z, but A, but changing slightly as we go along. So that's, that's kind of the hypothesis, and I want to test that. But And one of the key parts of this is this argument that um, prepared core bifacial technology, often called the Valois, but it can take other forms too, might have been a key technology. It's something we see in Africa. Uh, it's something that we see in Arabia and India. But then as we move beyond India towards Indonesia, it's unclear whether we still have the Valois or if it's changing into something else or if they've abandoned it entirely. There's some evidence now that in China they might have some the Valois, but it's not widespread. Uh, and I would argue that we have some things that look a bit like Lavalwa here in Indonesia, but it's not the same technology. It's something a bit different, but maybe evolved from it or, or modified into it, or maybe just reinvented. So that's the question that I would like to know about. Um, I'd, I might even demonstrate a Lavalwa core after this, because I think actually it, it uh, illustrates a lot of the key features in stone tool napping. 
like how to make big flakes from a core that are sharp all the way around the outside without cortex on them, how to use a combination of faceting and hard hammer platform preparation, uh, things like that. So it might be a good one to illustrate and also just to reinforce this concept that there's something distinctive about that technology that we might be able to pick up even if it is changing a bit along the way. So if we look at what's happening in East Africa, say 60 to 100,000 years ago, about the time period that we think modern humans might be moving out of Africa and eastward along that southern dispersal route through India and so on, the sorts of technologies that we see are indeed these um, big Lavawa cores with lots of big Lavawa flakes, bifacial points, unifacial points, uh, even Lavawa point technology, which is where you strike off a pointed flake. You don't have to retouch it. It's preformed. And the core technology is very distinctive. Okay, let's move further east. What do we see? Oh, or in North Egypt, same thing, Northern Africa. Lots of Lavawa, lots of points, uh, and not really backed artifacts or anything blady. When we move across to Arabia, it's not one technology. There's some just different re regional patterns, but we see, for instance, in Oman, Lavawa technology and Lavawa point technology. So they're making these preformed triangular flakes up in uh, the north of Arabia, up at Juba. Again, Lavawa and some evidence of points as well. And in Jebel Fire, something a little bit different still. And then where I've just been working recently, uh, lots of evidence of Lavawa again. Uh, this is dating at 80 to 100,000 or maybe even 80 to 100 to 70,000 points, Lavawa points and Lavawa cores. So very interesting. Then we move further east again to India. And in the two work places I've worked, Jureru Valley, uh, lots of Lavawa, some points, sometimes with tangs on them this time, which is interesting. So something a bit more like an Aterian technology. And uh, lots of sites across the valley that show this. Um, a change through time from Lavawa to something more blady later on. But in that early period, it's definitely a Lavawa technology. Uh, and then in the Son, up in the northern part of India where I've worked, uh, Kashi and I wrote a paper on this. And again, Lavawa technology. Uh, not so much in the way of points now, though, which is interesting. Some Lavawa points. And then we move further east again into Southeast Asia. And, you know, as you know, there's a, it, there's a lot of diversity in what people are doing in Indonesia. So I couldn't characterize it on one slide. There's different things happening in different places. And I think a lot of work still needs to be done to really compare those different places and say, how do their technologies and sequences differ? But, you know, I've made the case, and probably wrongly, but who knows, that, uh, you know, in places like Timor, maybe we do get a technology that's kind of has some resemblance to Lavalwa in a sense, and I'll, and I'll go through in a second what that is, but things like these flakes here that have the, cent the classic centripetal flake scar pattern with faceted platforms. These, if you just took these flakes in isolation, you'd say, oh yeah, they look a lot like small Lavalwa flakes. But then when we look at the cores in detail, we actually see that the technology is a, is a little bit, oh, I'll just skip through that, is a little bit different. It actually looks more like this here. So we take a large flake with a big, bulb of percussion on the top. And remember I was saying before that, you know, can you call it a core if it's got a big bulb of percussion on it? Technically, no. But we do see these retouched core flake technologies that look like the Valwa. So they start with a big um, flake with a big ventral surface, and then they make their way by faceting around the outside, so making a steep platform edge, take one flake off, another flake off, another flake off, another flake off. And finally, the flake that comes off at the end looks a bit like this. It looks like a Lavawa flake, but is it Lavawa? Technically, no, it's not. And one reason that we can see that it's not is because we often have a lot of ventral, part of this original ventral surface can sometimes still appear on the dorsal surface of those flakes. Here's a little bit just here. So we can still see the bulb of percussion, parts of it still on the dorsal surface. So, you know, you can, you can have what we call Lavawa Nazis, people who are like, it has to be this and nothing else, otherwise it's not Lavawa. But the scheme, the, the technology behind it is not dissimilar. Does that mean it's evolved or derived from Lavawa? I don't know. I, we, we can't really answer that question yet. But certainly we see things that look a bit like it. And then when we get to Australia, we also see, again, centripetal core technology, an upper and a lower hemisphere, so flaked on two sides like a Lavawa core. Uh, with faceting sometimes around the outside. We don't have a lot of examples. We have some points, 
but we also have new things appearing in Australia too, axes and lots of grindstones. So the technology, if this is an African technology that's evolved along the way, it's changing. So by the time you get to Australia, it's something different. Indonesia, something different. But then by the time we go back to, say, India, we can see the points are dropping out, but still Lavawa. When we go back to Arabia, the points and the Lavawa are both there. And then when we get to back to East Africa, the whole package is there. And one way that I've sort of characterized this is by looking at a declining diversity in toolkits as we move east of Africa. So here we have Africa. We have the biggest range of different types of tools present in East Africa. You know, bifacial, tanged, Lavalwa, Lavalwa point, and so on. As we move further east, we can see that this diversity drops down. So it's there's there's a biological, possible biological explanation for this, as well as a cultural one. And that is that as people are moving, their populations are subdividing. So people move into an area, they establish themselves, and then they fission, and a new group moves off to the next spot. And maybe as they do this, they don't take the entire technological repertoire with them. They sort of subsample it each time. They take a slightly smaller version of it and a slightly smaller version. And they're also innovating as they go. They're coming up with new ideas as they encounter new environments, like as they come into the jungles of Southeast Asia, make the water crossings to Southeast Asia, into ICEA, and then another big water crossing to Australia. And when they get to Australia, oh, sorry, as they go through Wallacea, they don't have the big fauna anymore. It's everything small. It's rats and snakes and bats. And then when they get to Australia, it's a totally different fauna and flora again. So we wouldn't expect people to do something exactly the same way all the way along, particularly as populations are crossing barriers, are getting, you know, little small founding populations are splitting off. But is there the germ of something similar? I think there probably is, but that's contentious. We, we can't be sure yet. So if we look at what Indonesian lithics tell us, uh, and it is a crucial region because I think it's the it's the first big stepping off point, obviously, from mainland Asia, from Sunda. It's the first big crossings to the islands, even though they were joined to the mainland at certain times, but with sea levels come rising and falling. And then when they step off and make their way across to Wallacea, to those islands, of course, now it's a different world, different fauna. Um, I, crossings are required. Populations might be smaller new, new flora, um, fauna or a different way of living, maybe more marine subsistence. So it's a crucial region in understanding how what people brought with them from Africa might undergo transitions and changes. Now, there's also there's been these common perceptions about Southeast Asia. And of course, it just depends on where you look. There is no one Indonesian lithic industry, right? They're different in different places and different times. But the common perception is that there's few or no distinctive tool types. Well, we know that that's wrong. That the techniques are simple, the flaking techniques. Well, we now know that that's wrong too. That it doesn't fit the out of Africa lithic story. Well, certainly not a classic East African or a upper Paleolithic. That doesn't fit. But there might still be some things there that are similar. That it's not very responsive to climate change. That's not true either. Even though it probably rainforests and things persisted right through glacial maximum and so on. We also have things like savanna corridors potentially opening up and closing and sea levels rising and falling. Aridity comes and goes in places. So people would be responding to that. And I think we have good evidence that they do. Uh, that there's little note or no change, that it's a static culture with no change. Total nonsense. And finally, I mean, we know that there's also new migrants coming in all the time as well. They're bringing in new technologies, new economies and so on. So there's a lot of change through time. And that artifacts are small and hardly retouched. Well, they probably are often quite small, but they're not always small. And the degree of retouch seems to depend, again, at what period of time you're looking at. So I think these perceptions are largely false. They represent maybe uh, the fact that there's not a good summary, maybe, that people put out there to the world about you know the diversity of technologies that exists in Indonesia. It's probably something that could be addressed. Uh, but that there is a lot of regional subtle change going on, even in those parts of, of um, it's Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, like say Nusa Tenggara region, you know, Timor and Roti and those areas, the technologies don't change in the sense that you get suddenly backed artifacts or suddenly points or something. But if you look at their sequence, they are changing the whole time. There's a lot of subtle change through there. And that's where being a good technologist, being someone who really can read the lithics and record that in detail, will be able to pick up those subtle changes. And that's the sort of thing that we need to, to move towards and already are doing so. 
So I'll just kind of falsify some of those arguments. Is there distinctive artifact types? Well, I mean, that's one. I don't know how good an example it is, but things like the Pleistocene pierces, uh, it's something that we've found at quite a few different islands now. It does seem to be a possibly a drilling or piercing tool, but who knows? We haven't done the functional analysis, so that's just one that I'm putting out there. What about things like projectile tips? There's more and more evidence now coming out from all the way from Borneo across to uh, Timor of what looks like impact fractures on the tips of, of stone tips. So, and we see this in the form of these long uh, spin-off or, or um, uh, flute or burin-like fractures that we're seeing on these tips. Uh, and these things clear, clearly were retouched on one side and, and not on the other. So they could well have been little unifacial points or something. We also know that uh, bone osseous technology is at least 35,000 years old. So we have every reason to believe projectile technology was there, but finding the traces of it is, is kind of something that's only slowly accumulating, but we have some evidence there. Now also Liang John in uh, East Kalimantan, early Holocene backed artifacts with projectile impact fractures on them and some convergent like triangular flakes also with Buran impact fractures. So this is kind of something that's just really starting to emerge in the literature now. So probably we'll find many more examples of that the more we look. Also late Pleistocene, early Holocene, uh, there are formal types in the form of these points and they're now widespread across uh, Southeast Asia. That's been known for a long time, but new discoveries all the time. So, uh, um, really, and uh, who was the other person that Afit Alifa, yeah, did this amazing um, study just published with these incredible pressure pressure flaked little bifacial points that you know look like they could come out of the Salutrian of of Europe. Not that there's any connection to that place, but uh, you know you, you study those in detail and you can see clearly they've been pressure flaked. Uh, the fineness of the retouch on the edges, the long scars that meet in the middle, and so on. And again, that doesn't mean that there's bifacial points that have been pressure flaked all through Indonesia. If you look at the, the map that, that uh, they put together in that paper, you can see it's quite different in different places. Some have the hollow base, um, possibly with pressure, like you've, you've got to actually cast example of that one there, haven't you? And then those uh, um, Tengiaku, uh, Tengakaya, the uh, bifaces from Northern Borneo. So there's a lot of diversity there that still hasn't been perhaps well explored or dated. So there's a lot of work to do there too. And then the microblades, also from the Kangian Islands, so from Gua Aka. Uh, incredible microblade technology that you know any technologist can see when they look at these platforms with the little bending initiation and the little tiny bulb and the curvature on the distal end. These things are classic punch blades. And that's not something that had been documented in you know, Indonesia before either. So that's a new technology just discovered. So you can see that the more we look into this, the more diversity we're gonna see. We're gonna see regional stories um, that need to be told. And then of course, all the mid -Holo and, mid and late Holocene implement types that appear more widespread. So in, particularly in Sulawesi and um, East Kalimantan, the, the Maros points, the microdenticulate solids, the, the back mi microliths, not so much, I don't know what I've written up there, back microliths uh, of various types and styles. Now, why do these things all appear in the mid late Holocene? And there's many possible explanations we could give to that for that. But, you know, I think it's something that's ongoing. We haven't got the answers to all of that yet. I don't think it's contact with Asia. I think it's probably an indigenous development. That seems to be quite clear. And it's probably responses to things that are happening in the early and the late and the mid Holocene. Things like sea level rise, climate change, new mobility, maybe as people are seafaring, new economies as they adapt to, to, to a post sea level rise uh, climate and fauna. And what about change through time? I mean, this is just my, one of my examples from Timor, and I've just split this long graph into two, so you can see them here. This is the top and that's the bottom. But, you know, if we look through time at this site at Machakuru, we can see that there's a lot of changes going on through time. Heat treating, for instance, changing a great deal over time. Obsidian becoming more common from the late Pleistocene onwards. Things like gloss on the flakes also starting to ramp up slowly through time. Ventral flaking, so the flaking of those big, thick flakes in a lavawa like way, we can see that that also is a bit cyclical. It's right the way through, but it comes and goes in its intensity. Redirecting flakes, that's where you're turning the core to flake different platforms. And you get a little flake that comes off that has the old platform still stuck on it. That's indicating also changes in how much 
they're rotating their cores through time. So try to extract more use from their raw material. Edge damage also coming and going, retouch also peaking in various places. Bipolar, another really important technology for crushing the flake. And as, as I'll show you when we start flaking a little later, I'll, I'll do a bit of bipolar just to show you that the, the advantage of bipolar is that you can use very small pieces and you can get the biggest possible flake from a small piece. So a little pebble or a little core that you finished with, you put it on an anvil and you crack it and you'll get the biggest possible flake you can get from it. If you kept holding it in your hand and striking it, you'd only get tiny little flakes. So it's a way of um, making the most use of a small amount of raw material and things like cores and so on. So total artifacts, we're also seeing changes in occupational intensity through time. What does this all mean? Well, at this site, um, I, I put this together to basically show that during wet and dry periods at the site, and this is measured by rising and lowering lake levels of the Lake Irrelala Road that's right next to this site, uh, and from general climate data for Southeast Asia, is that you can see that during the wet phases, you have a big peak in occupation, but not much of retouch, not much rotating of cores, not much bipolar, um, not much ventral flaking. But then when we come into the dry time, all of those things go become incredibly common. So it's like people are transforming their technology to respond to a little bit of aridity, probably in order to um, make their raw material last longer, probably because they're moving around more. It's drier, they've got to go to new places to find food. Maybe they're connecting up with different groups in different ways. I mean, lots of possible explanations. But the point is that climate and stone tools are telling a story. Like the stone tools are very sensitive to the climate change. And people are changing the way they're, they're using their stone tools and probably moving around the landscape. So you look at a site like Machukuru. If you didn't look closely and you didn't look at the subtle changes, you'd just say everything stays the same all the way through. But it's not the case. There's a lot of change going on in there. So I've just kept this session much shorter than the first one, um, but my conclusions are on all of this is that there are diverse lithic industries across Indonesia and that really only beginning to be documented. Even though there's been 100 years or more of, of archaeology in Indonesia, new things are still being discovered, you know, more detailed attention to sites, more understanding of technology, um, better dating. All those things are coming into effect now so that we can better understand these, uh, this long period of time and of human habitation. And that we can't, I don't think we can understand this technology well unless we have a good understanding of how those regional patterns are, are um, falling out, where they are, how old they are, when they come in. Is there, are they identical or are they a bit different in each place? Um, and also by studying the fine grained, detailed technology. So looking at the platforms, looking at bipolar, looking at retouch and how much there is looking at what, what sort of flaking systems are being used and compiling all of that into sort of a big sequence for different islands and different places would, I think, tell a fascinating and very diverse story of how people are living in the islands and uh, throughout Indonesia through time. And of course, we're, we're trying to do this in, in order to understand these big questions, innovation, local invention versus migration and sharing of ideas how humans and hominins before that have responded to big climate changes, uh, to loss of fauna, to sea level rise and fall, and of course, responses to climate change. So you're the next generation, you know, you're the ones now learning all about stone tool technology from people like Anton and others here. And, you know, hopefully you'll be picking up these skills and developing them so that you can go out there and actually do this kind of work and, and you know, really flesh out that very important and very interesting and diverse local set of sequences. So what I thought I'd do for the last little session is that you'll get to make something, but I'll also demonstrate something for you as well. So I've got some flint here that I've brought from Australia and some hammer stones and things, and, and Anton's sourced some little hammer stones. So we'll do a couple of things. One, I think I'll make a Lavalwa core and show you some of the principles of flaking around that. And then I might do the same thing on a thick flake and show you how the principles are quite similar, actually, even though the flakes look a little bit different. And then I think we'll make a little backed microlith each. So you'll, we've got a bag full of little obsidian and flint blades there and some hammer stones and anvils. And I'll teach you how you can make your own little artifact. It's quite easy. You'll probably break a few, but that's okay. And um, it's part of learning and also what happens in the archaeological record. Uh, so yeah, I guess we'll we move outside for this bit, are we? Yeah.
I think I have time for that, yeah. Uh, before we continue for the uh, experiment, any question? Oh, you could, uh, boleh bertanya pakai bahasa Indonesia nanti di translate. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, uh, Professor Chris. Uh, uh, before uh, I address the further question, let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Hatter Jabaran. I'm from University of Indonesia. And uh, I want to address a brief question to you uh, and a notion maybe. Uh, and the question is, uh, do you agree about... Uh, the notion that says uh, the climate changes and the other variables that uh, indicates that uh, there is uh, uh, the constant the constant changes in Indonesia, uh, yeah, uh, tons of uh, variable that uh, you know, uh, causes uh, the the changes in uh, uh, stone tools in Indonesia, yeah. Like uh, I said before, like uh, such as climate change and m many others, uh, have uh, implicates that uh, in Indonesia uh, and other Oceania uh, region, there is uh, many um, form of uh, stone tools, and in in uh, in that uh, there's in that plenty of uh, form of uh, stone tools. Uh, we can see th there's uh, there's more uh, simple uh, from uh, compared to when we can uh, compare stone tools in Europe or in uh, Africa or in uh, Eastern Asia. Uh, I think, uh, do you agree with that notion or you have uh, an argument, uh, a scientific argument that uh, maybe uh, support or deny that uh, notion. Thank you. Do you get the question? <laughs> Technology in Indonesia possibly simpler than yeah. in Indonesia, and does it respond to climate change? Yes. Uh, yes, it definitely responds to climate change, but you know how it does in each place is, I think, something that still needs to be worked out. Uh, there's a lot of work to do there, you know, fine-grained work to look at those subtle changes and also to work out when the periods of climate change happen and what they look like, you know. Is it that rainforest is retreating and savannah is growing or uh, is it that, you know, um, coastline is expanding with sea levels dropping? So many, you know, detailed environmental reconstruction still to do in order to understand that in each place. Secondly, is it responsive to climate change? I think when we do have a good sense of how the climate's changing, we can see that it is um, that it is responding very sensitively and very quickly. So I would say yes, lots of evidence that climate is an important variable here, even though we think of it as tropics and on the equator and maybe not changing in the way of like Northern Europe where you have glaciers coming and then goes back to being temperate forest. We don't have that obviously but I think there's a lot still happening here. Secondly, are the artifacts here simpler? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't, I think it's a, it's a bad way to think about it anyway. Like what is simple and what is complex? The technology that is being used here is appropriate. I think is probably, you know, it, it, it worked. It did the job. And at time it does become very formal and complex. The projectile points, the punch blades, etc. Those things come and go just as we see in all the other parts of the world. In Africa, those things come for a while, they change, and then they go again. In Australia, the same thing. So I think we are getting the same kind of human responsiveness and the same kind of technological innovation in Indonesia as we see anywhere else in the world. So I, I don't think it's a matter of simple or more complex. I think the same things are happening. It might just look a bit different here. Any other question? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, sorry for uh, my English is not very well, but I ask question with the Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> okay. Uh, kenalkan nama saya Muhammad Dafal Farizi uh, dari Universitas Indonesia. Uh, saya ingin menanyakan di uh, setidaknya kita uh, membicarakan aspek 
uh, global mengenai uh, climate change dan kenaikan muka air laut gitu. Uh, selain itu, uh, selain ada faktor global, faktor-faktor lokal apa yang bisa menyebabkan terjadinya perubahan atau inovasi dari uh, alat itik itu sendiri. Itu yang pertama. Yang kedua, kita melihat tadi bahwa di uh, untuk memahami proses evolusi ataupun penyebaran dari alat-alat tadi, kita melihat bahwa uh, situs-situs yang berada di timur Indonesia itu uh, cukup penting dan uh, apakah ada hubungannya antara yang dari Northwest Australia tadi dengan yang pulau-pulau tadi seperti Rote, Seram, dan yang lain-lain. Itu sih, Mas. Uh, thank you for... Okay, the first question. Uh, is there any other... Uh, uh, because the, the technology is... The, the change, because uh, there's global changing in climate, is there any like uh, uh, specific just regional uh climate change that could affect all the uh, the, the 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 evolution of stone tools also not just global because the the rise of yeah regional the regional yeah uh the second one is is there any uh, similarities uh the stone tools uh the eastern part of indonesia with australia and the pacific yeah Is there any connection? Uh, the stone that we found, the sites that we found in Rote, have connection with the Australian uh, history or stone tools, just like that. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, I, you know, if you were to characterize the stone tool technology of most of Australia for most of the time, it is not very formal. Not much typology. So you're not seeing points, you're not seeing blade technology, you're not seeing, you're seeing, yeah, you could say simple, but they're basically kind of expedient core technologies. Uh, and that, in a sense, is very similar, I guess, to a lot of what we see in Eastern Indonesia, except that there are, I think, some interesting differences as well. So that the flaking of the macro flakes, the big flakes to make these lavawa like cores or whatever you want to call them, truncated faceted or whatever you want to call them, flake cores. We don't really see that in Australia. So that might be a peculiarity of the way in which flakes are being moved around or the raw material that they're using or something. I don't know, but we don't really see that so much in mainland Australia, but we shouldn't neglect New Guinea and New Guinea was part of Sahul as well. And that northern route might well have been the main one that people used to get here. But almost no work has been done in New Guinea on that coast in the north there. So we really, you know, I think there's a lot of work still to be done to see if there are connections there or not. Uh, in terms of specific climate changes in Indonesia, uh, I think, you know, cli world climate patterns follow each other largely but it, they play out differently in different places so you know in the in europe you get cold and ice in australia you get aridity you know and a bit cooler but aridity is the main thing so not glaciers but um just drier in south in island southeast asia or in mainland southeast asia i think it's to do with you know expansion and contraction of rainforests and savannas uh probably falling lake levels uh, rising and lowering sea levels, so connectivity between islands or islands fragmenting from one another, those things are going to have profound influences. But how they play out in each place, I don't think has been fully determined yet. There's a lot of work still to find out, you know, what happened in each place. Yeah. Menjawab nggak? Ada pertanyaan lagi? Anyone? Mumpung... Pak Kris ada di sini. Pak Kris. <laughs> yeah, they just can't wait to like <laughs> to do some stone tools, crushing stones, break, <laughs> break stones, break stones. Any other question? Maybe from Zoom. Uh, well, Alifa was trying to ask, but she hasn't typed any question. 
Terima kasih Anton izin bertanya. Ah ya silakan Mbak. Suaranya terjerangan jelas ya. Ya jelas ya. Oh, Oke okay. thank you Chris for your uh, great presentation and also thank uh, who mentioned our team of finding at the Kangen Island. Uh, I think it is uh, very interest, uh, interesting to, uh, to talk about the emerge of the similar stone technology in uh, several distant location. Uh, about this case, uh, please give me more explanation. Uh, which do you think has more influence? Uh, does this happen due to the uh, change of knowledge? Uh, I mean, uh, cause of uh, diffusion or migration, or uh, more due to the process of the adaptation of the human uh, to the environment. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, not uh, 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 related to the context uh, change or knowledge change. Thank you. Terima kasih, Anton. Uh, yeah, good, very good question. Is it is it climate? Is it adaptation? Is it migration? Is it diffusion? I mean, these are the questions archaeologists have been trying to answer for a hundred years, and it's it's very difficult. But I think the amazing thing about Southeast Asia, Indonesia, that's coming from the genetics is the fact that it's not like just one dispersal of humans in and then nothing. There's there's back migration. There's new migrations coming in from Northern Asia with you know, Austronesians. Uh, there's back migration from Papua. So there's a, a dynamic human story going on. And, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to try and uh, document that, to explain it. I think, yes, climate adaptation is a big factor in stone tools, especially because that's our main primary means of getting our food and hunting and chopping things up. Uh, and the stone is not ubiquitous. It's not everywhere in the landscape. You have to go and get it. And how mobile you are determines how often you can go and get it, how much you can carry, things like that. So I think a lot of what happens in stone tools reflects those yeah. sorts of variables about mobility, how much time you spend in a place, what activities you're, you're conducting. But there are, of course, many different ways of doing the same thing, many different ways of breaking a stone. And people do change the way they do that and respond you know, it appears they respond differently through time. Is that migration and diffusion? I'd say yes, sometimes, definitely, but very hard to track. Uh, if we look at, for instance, the, the spread of backed artifacts and Maros points, for instance, around, you know, uh, Eastern Kalimantan, so Borneo and Sulawesi, obviously there's a sort of a community of cultural practice going on there that would seem to indicate some sort of exchange and interaction potentially, or maybe they just all individually came up with it on their own. But, you know, I think in those sorts of instances where there's a clear geographic connection, where the stone tools look very similar, they kick in at about the same time, uh, we're probably getting closer to explaining that as some sort of interaction. And in the case of Kangian and, and uh, your work, there, there doesn't seem to be any clear connection to any other regional technology so it would appear to be local innovation unless some yeah, aliens or or someone on a boat got from you know wherever china or something uh it would seem to be that that's a case of people came up with a innovative and interesting new way of doing something for reasons we don't understand yet thank you any other question before we move out for the uh workshop political workshop Anyone uh, from Zoom? No. So we're going to have a like very short break, like five minute break. So because we're going to set up everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So see you guys in a bit. In five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Where is your mobile phone? Yeah, yeah. You still have to speak with this with one microphone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the tape. <laughs> 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 
kan dari sini bisa oh di Tapi nanti saya kita siang Cek, cek. Halo, cek, cek. Ada sih. Tapi ini masih nggak lima loh. Iya. Yang di share masih. No. Cocix, cocix. Ah? Ini ini. Ya, you can start, uh, Chris. <laughs> And very, very early on, they discovered that uh, one of the easiest ways to do that was just to smash a stone on a rock, even if it was a flake or a pebble. And this is the origins of the, the bipolar technology, which we know. It goes back millions of years. And so normally, if, if you were to take a small pebble like this of church or quartz or whatever it might be, you know, to try and get a good-sized flake off that, you can't do it. You, you can break a little flake off the edges, but that's it. But if you use bipolar technology, you can get often the biggest flake imaginable from such a small uh, core. I'll, I'll demonstrate now. So I don't have a very big hammer stone, but I'll see how it goes. So this is the animal stone. The angle stone is, has this pitting in the middle, that's, and that's results from frequent hitting on the side. And by holding that on, on the top, and breaking it again and again, you start to get crushing. So you see the crushing on the end? That's the first sign of the bipolar. But if we keep going, hopefully we'll now get a nice big plate to come off. So we've got a small plate, but hopefully we can actually split that in half at some point soon. And now I've got crushing on two ends. And that's, that's the thing we look for. And the anvil stones as well. You can see it's making a big dent in the rock. So let's see if we can get some more.
most likely to copy north. Quite small ones, but they're very thin and sharp the way around. But what you can't do with bipolar is control the, the shape of the plate. Whatever comes off is whatever comes off. Whereas with other technologies, you control the flake, you shape the core carefully, and you make sure that the flake that comes off at the end is the one that you want. And I'll demonstrate that in a second. I'll get off it still. Yeah. Now you see we get three flakes, you can hang those around, of equal length. So we split right the way through the middle and we get a sharp edge all the way around. So it's the most expedient, the simplest, but in some ways, the most effective. There's lots of the sort of debitage that you'll get from bipolar. You'll get a lot of crushing in the middle, a hammer stone, also with heavy crushing, and lots of chips and debris. And, you know, often little quartz pebbles or little flint pebbles we use, or, you know, you might start with a core of this size, work it down to nothing, 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 and then crush on the anvil. That gives you the last bit of stone that you can get out of it. So when we see a lot of bipolar in sites, it could mean that they only have small stones that they can find, or that they've worked down the stone until there's nothing left. So they're really eking it, they're really kind of extending how much they can get out of it. Okay, so now I'll show you a different way of doing this. And this is the one where you control the, the flaking process. And I'm using something called a copper bopper. <laughs> this is not a prehistoric implement. This is a cheating implement, yeah. But it's very good. It does the job. So, I mean, you can do the same. And obviously, you can strike off. This is hard hammer flaking, basically, where, you know, you just hit it and the big flakes come off. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll bifacially, so two sides, work this, this stone. And what I'm going to do is make, have you heard of the tortoise core? It's the, um, it looks like a tortoise shell. And that's, that's the, the stage you need to get to to make the big Lavalle flake. So it's another way of getting a big flake from the core. And I'll just sort of chip away here for a few minutes. And I'll try and um, get this shape to come out of the core. Sorry about the shatter and the spray. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a flatter top here, which is what we call the upper hemisphere, and a steeper bottom. So it'll, um, and that's what will make it look a bit like the tortoise, like the legs are coming out the bottom there. Health and safety. Yeah. So I'll just work my way around. So bifacially, just like with a hand axe, one on this side, one on that side. Eventually the flakes all meet up and there's no cortex left on that side. And you can see how much wastage there is early on with any bifacial technology. So many flakes coming off to shape. And, you know. Final piece.
Masih di mute, Mas Anton, Mas Ruli. Tidak terdengar suaranya di Zoom. Okay, so anyone looks at that, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, it's a big spray pump. Looks like a big retouch flake, right? And yeah, it is. It's a big retouch flake. But what we can now do is use this bulb of percussion and the curvature here to make the valvoir like flakes. That's what our early stage cores often look like. They've got a big flake scar taken off here and ventral surface on that flake. But let's do another one and we'll see that that ventral surface slowly starts to get lost. So here's one back the other way. And we can see that the scar pattern on the surface of this core still got ventral here, ventral here, but these scars are starting to take over that whole ventral surface. Let's do some more. There's another big one. It broke, unfortunately, but um, again, you have essentially a Laval flake coming off out of that core. It's got the faceting on the platform. It's got the scar pattern starting to appear on the flake, but also still some ventral on there as well. So before you do maybe only one or two more, it will basically be a Laval core. And I'll see, hopefully I'll get a final flake off that looks just like a Laval flake. And then I think that's all of the ventral gone now, apart from this little bit here. So, you know, you look at that, you see the centripetal flake scar pattern. I'll do one more and we'll see if we can get a classic of our flake from it. So this is what they were doing in those little caves and rock shelters throughout um, Ireland, Southeast Asia. They were chipping the cores like this to make these portable, Lavalois like cores. And you can see, I hope, why I kind of like draw the connection a bit between the two, even though it's not identical. Right. Get one to go all the way across. Oh, no. Okay, but this is an important thing. This is called overshot, okay? <laughs> So the Lavalois flake went all the way across. But see this flake here that's come off? It preserves the old platform edge. So remember I was saying overshot flakes can tell you about what the platform edge looked like. And these are good because when we find these, and we do find these in the site, it's what they call in France the Debordon flake. It's the one that's spilled over the edge, and it's taken with it part of the bifacial core edge. So when we find the Debordon flakes, we know they're doing the bifacial flaking. Okay, I'll just do one more. And you can see, you can just keep work, reworking this core again and again. It gets smaller and smaller. 
Lots of little flakes come off in the process. Uh, they keep splitting, hitting them a bit too hard. Remember how I said if you split, hit them too hard, they split. But, you know, if you found that in a, in a site in France, you'd go Laval or Cork. Yep. So does that kind of make the point? Yeah. And they're not always flakes down to that degree. Uh, sorry, they're not always flaked completely on the surface. Sometimes you still see ventral, but they take them down to this size, absolutely minuscule. So they'll just keep going until there's nothing left. Okay, uh, so that's... Do you want me to do one more thing, like a bifacial point or something? From... Yes. We've got time, and then we'll do back to yes. yes. Okay. What do you want, hand axe or bifacial point? Hand axe for the collection? Okay, so what you'll see now is just like the Laval four that I did, it's bifacial, but it's not the one you've got there. It's it's um less curved, it's flatter on top and steep on the bottom. And on the bottom side, this cortex still there. Mm -hmm. With the hand axe, we're taking all the cortex off both sides and symmetry top and bottom. No flat, thick one, but all the way through. So it looks like a lens shape, they call it. And again, we just work our way through the piece bifacially. And I have to, from the outset, I'm going to remember, this is probably going to be my tip down here. So it's going to be a shorthand axe, but I'll leave this one as cortex at the base to hold it with. So you can butcher a stegodon or something. Good flint like this, good chert. It's so easy to do. It's you'll see. It takes me no time at all to make a hand axe if I don't break it. So in a way, it's a, it is a kind of an expedient technology because it's very quick. See those longer thinning flakes coming across now. And also, you keep the lot of flakes that you could use. That's right. So. Yep. Yeah, very, <laughs> very thin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then this is a bazooka. <laughs> See how I said, if you get a step termination, it's really annoying. And you're always like, Arr! so the beautiful thing about bifacial technology is I've got a step there. I can't flake any more there. It'll just more steps. But I come from this side, it'll take that step off. And that's what I'll do a bit later on, is I'll just take that right off from the other side. Okay, so one of the things that you do to get the flakes to come all the way across, and this is something they did more and more later on, is grinding. It's not so common in hand axes, although they do do it towards the end. But um, it's not good for your lungs either. But uh, this is something that, for instance, on those... Um, Kangi and little bifaces, they would be grinding those edges. And see how you get the really long flakes off them? And look at the platform, it's non-existent. It's just a little tiny crushed dot. There's nothing left there. And those are called thinning flakes. And when we start to get those thinning flakes coming off, we know that people are really in business on their core. And we try and make them come all the way to the middle. So we're already getting the bifacial, bifacial hand axe shape now. Yeah, that goes all, almost all the way across. Look how thin those flakes are. I mean, they're great for skinning, butchering, anything. this up.
almost there. We've just got to bring it down to a point. Clean it up a little bit more. There we go. Oh, oh hinge termination. Very bad. Okay. <laughs> because with the biface, I can take it off from a little bit over here and get rid of that. Not the end of the world. <laughs> if that were like trying to do an ultra thin projectile point, though, that would suck that away. Look at that. Oh, wow. Very thin, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's see if we can get rid of that hinge termination. So here we might have a bit of grinding. Almost gone. And then we'll do one from across the side. Let's we'll get rid of the whole thing now. In a minute, you'll be able to hold it and you'll immediately want to butcher something. If it wasn't Ramadan, you could go home and So I've now got the point on. So like in less than 10 minutes, you've got a, a biface basically. And then it's just a matter of, you know, if you want to do a bit of thinning here or there just to kind of, uh, you know. No, I won't, don't worry. As if I'd break it. That never happens. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get rid of this little lump here. Now we'll see the power of the biface as a, as a way of fixing mistakes. There we go. Oh. All gone. So it went right the way across and took those nasty uh, hinge terminations off. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I'll finish it off and you can hand it around and have a look. Oh, yeah, what do you reckon? Done? Yeah, it's already nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's just hand that around. Looks oh. good, already. Any volunteer? Yeah. Let me cut. Hold out your arm. <laughs> it's not a tool, maybe. It's more like art or something like that. Yeah. Art object. <laughs> In in Cima de los Huesos, they throw the bifas, right? Yeah. To the, 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 the yeah. Excal. Yeah. Excalibur. Yeah. 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 Any question, guys? So when you feel it, you just 
can see it's got the serrated edge, so it's excellent for slicing. It's one of the best properties of the yeah. sharp long from the end, getting your way in. Yeah. Uh, base on the cortical base, sometimes they did flaking all the way around, but later on more and more the cortical base just to hold it. You could even discus it. In my course, we do discus with hand axe. Just, yeah, and it's really effective. You can make it skim off the floor and hit things in the legs or throw it high at the head. Uh, and and easy to resharpen. Be something to whip. Yes. Yep, that's right. Yep. Impact. yep, that's right. Boom, to the head, yeah. yeah. Just don't annoy the animal. <laughs> you have to throw like 10 of them at once. A lot of things. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Ceremonial hand axe. Mm. Ceremonial <laughs> Got a question. Any question? Chris, why are you, I mean, how, how long you trained to be a good napper is just like that? Well, I'm self-taught entirely, but it takes time, yeah. I mean, my first hand, you know, first attempt was not very good. With time, you get better. You watch videos. You see other people napping. Uh, I, you know, almost cut a finger off once and things like that. Glass in the eye, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So make sure you got glasses on. Wear your safety gloves. Um, but you know, the main the main problem is just having a good stone to play with. Yeah. Uh, if you just want to do bipolar, no problem. But you know, you've got this um, Pachitan flint. It's good stone. Like if you go and send someone off to collect a lot of it, you could have a little napping club and you could all be practicing right. and learning, making different sorts of yeah. stone tools, yeah. But it does take years. I mean, Neanderthals, who were excellent nappers, yeah. excellent nappers, they probably spent 20 years getting good at it, you know. Because to make something like a beautiful triangle flake just come off perfectly, yeah. that's about as hard as anything you can ever do. Yeah. And they did it one after another yeah. all the time, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Sure. Maybe it's just a simple question. What's considered a good stone? Yeah. Oh. So basically, fine, very fine grain. So you can see, like on this thing, it's this great stuff because you know you, it's like plastic. It's, it's yeah, yeah. So smooth and soft. Yeah. And if you look at that under a microscope, you'll see there's no grains. It's just silica. In a, in a crystal matrix. And, uh, you know, you can get really good quality grainy materials too. Like we talk about silcrete, it's quite common in Australia. Quartzite, which is sandstone that's been compressed under heat or pressure. That can be very good, quartzite. Even volcanic rocks, top quality basalt, obsidian. You know, they're all fine grained. They all flake well, so they get conchoidal fracture, sharp and stay sharp. Uh, those are the main things, yeah. And then if you want to grind something, you need something a bit softer as well. You need to be able to flake it, but then grind it. So people did grind flint. It took hundreds of hours. So like in Denmark and places like that, and even here, they made these axes where they used a punch like this. And they would punch off flakes. Like I'll give you an example. And they would punch off the flakes like that. Yep. And that's how they made their axes and things. And then once they'd made the axe, they would set about grinding that for hundreds of hours to make it sharp. Wow. And then the first time they hit the tree, they chip it because <laughs> it's so brittle. It's not a good material for axes. That's why most people use like basalt or a volcanic rock that's a bit softer and tougher because you can still chip it. But when you grind it and make an edge for chopping, it doesn't immediately chip. Yeah, this is too brittle really. But it's all I had. I think they were eating it. I had so much flint over there. Yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Any other question? Are you? Are you? Uh, hmm? uh, how would you determine the uh, watering stone and uh, and the good one, you know, uh, the difference between the wittering and not. Uh, when we can, when we uh, choose the stone, uh, yeah, there's a part that, uh, yeah, come up as a debit edge and uh, how, uh, how it, uh, it, what the difference uh, between it and uh, is it, uh, 
uh, dari dari mata dari mata telanjang itu bisa kita bisa melihat ada uh, yang ngelapuk nggak melihat perbedaan antara batu yang ngelapuk dengan yang tidak gitu jadi apakah itu bisa di determine gitu dilihat sometimes yes yeah uh, you can see the the fine grain um, see the ripples see the ripples that's a good sign that they that they flake very well the ripples really stand out uh, on a grainy material you won't have such fine features it, it will look grainy it will look rough the fracture plane might be blocky um, you know if you just look at uh, I don't know there's an It's just a cortical flake. Oh, yeah. So here, this was flaked, right? But it's very grainy and coarse. So you can see, even though there's flake scars there, that would be terrible to flake that chalk. So only on the inside is it good. And with quartz, uh, quartz is not very good to flake, but it does give sharp, strong edges. So this little nodule of... Um... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. This is... Sorry. Oh. And if you, if you heated it in a fire, it would be in there. So what you do is you bury it in the sand, sand over the top, make a fire, leave it there overnight. Next day when it's completely cool, don't touch it before it's completely cool, but when it's completely cool, you hit it, it'll be like ting, yeah. it'll be beautiful, and the flakes will come all the way off. Yeah. It'll change color. It might go bright red or purple or, you know, If you saw the heat treated ones, I had some heat damage flint inside. It was all bubbly and cracked, and it was bright red and purple. That was originally just this color. So it really changed color. Can we do that up? Yeah. Okay. Your turn. Ditaruh aja Ton kalau di bawah Ton. Diarahin bisa tuh pakai itu. You need a little anvil and a little hamstone like we've got here. And we take a blade. So these are little blades that I've made for hand like the cooking show. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> yeah. So there's lots of different blades in there. There's obsidian and flint, like this kind of thing. Now we look at look at our little blade and we go, okay, first thing, that's a nice straight edge. So that's the edge we don't touch. We just leave that sharp. And we're going to blunt this other edge here and make a shape out of it. Now, how do we do that? So basically, we're going to be rotating. Our... We're going to be placing that carefully on the edge and and at different angles to get the bits that we want to chip off and we just basically brush it see how that edge is crumbling away now it's delicate so you've got to be careful not to crack it in half so what you can see is slowly bit by bit this edge gets steeper until it turns into a, a backed edge so i'll keep working up working my way up there And we're working off all of the sharp edge until it's quite thick. So you can see how it's getting thicker now on that edge, and I'm getting up, getting the backing starting to appear there. And I'll keep working my way down till I have a long back point. Now, there's a cheap way to do it as well. And the cheap way is that you use pressure. And this is actually easier. It doesn't break. It's easy, and you'll get a better result too. But you know, this is copper, but they would have used bone or hardwood. Antlers, Antlers yeah. So I'll try and make it nice and thin and steep. So I have a few of these here. You can you can experiment with this as well. And I'm nearly, actually nearly done. So you can see it's very quick. 
if you've made the little blade, it's quite quick to then turn that into a backed artifact. And there's so many different shapes you could do. You could do a geometric shape, like a rectangle or a triangle. You can do what they call a crescent, so a, like a crescent moon that's um, curved. And the other thing about backed artifacts is you don't always have to just go from the ventral. You can turn them over and go the other way as well. So you can, you can take some little flakes off this way to make them even steeper. Okay, so that's the idea. Grab yourself um, a little flake and an anvil, and I'll donate my anvil now too. And you can see if I'll just pass around. I mean, we could do more work on that, but you'll see it's got a steeply back edge, and we've imposed a nice, like, long, pointy blade shape to it. Got rid of that wobbly edge that was there before. And the advantage of these little backed artifacts is that they glue on really well because they've got a complex retouched edge, so they glue onto a handle really well. Um, you can do all different orientations, so you can have like two of them to make a point. You can have them coming off as barbs. You can align them one after another to make a cutting blade. Uh, and they're, they're actually made stronger too by, when they're thin and wide, they snap easily. But when you make them thick and triangular like that, they're stronger. So yeah, there's lots of good reasons to make them. And that's why people keep rediscovering that technique over and over again. So yeah, grab a little blade, grab one of these, little hands, 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 take hands, a couple of these um, compression blades. Oh, oh my God. Get that one back. Go very gentle. <laughs> Yeah. 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 But I do, I do collect it, but it's not, not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just buy it so they can in the US. A box of it. Expensive, but you know, not I do have local stone, but it's grain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
ya, di luar, di luar, di luar, di luar. Itu kiri. Itu kanan, itu kanan. Ya. Yang satu megang, yang satu mukul. Ini 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 They can do some retouching. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
When do you think you'll get more? Yeah, 
That's what I mean. Like, I don't know, in Indonesia, you will never got any. I never got any, like, Le, Le Macre, the Crescent Blade, or yeah, yeah. Rejuvenation Blade. You don't have that. No, don't have but that. it seems like they they are using the natural, uh, or something. the natural yeah. convexity yeah. of the support of the blank. That sounds right. Yeah. Or they do it somewhere else. Yeah. Is there a, a source of the stone nearby? The source of what? The stone. Uh, yeah, because the source of the stone is not like the block of material like this. It's already like rounded material, like uh, pebbles, which already you open the the one surface, and then after that you got the you got the convexity. Yeah, so it's. So it's really not just open it before you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
How to respond to different rocks and how they play. <laughs> Yang apa yang garis-garis? Itu cortex, korteksnya. Biasanya dia dalam bentuk nodul di dalam di dalam gamping. Karena pada dasarnya lapuknya dia ber, ya foliated kayak gitu, berfoliasi. Terus kalau yang titik-titik ya disebutnya impurity ketidak apa ya? Ya itu korteks. Itu yang dihilangin.
Surprised Kashi didn't say time to go. <laughs> Put your toys away. Yeah. Late time to go. That's right. Okay. Well, I suppose I should take my Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I'll. You be both. Uh... <laughs> yep, for the teaching right. the class. Oh, that's yours. Yeah, the small one. Oh, are these all yours? Yeah, I think so. I think that's yours. No, no, this one is mine. That's that one yours. is mine. This one is mine. Yeah, that, yeah. that's it. That's it. Okay. Have, yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, one more. Bullet. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.
yang kepotong kan tangannya ya aman ya ada oh, alat batu biasanya sih setahu saya di UI bakarin ya bro yang biasanya suka bikin kelas workshop alat batu gini ya AB sekarang Oh, baiklah makanya. Oh gitu. Oke, okay. uh, so uh, I hope you guys enjoy all the workshop, the session, the first, the morning session, the the end of the session, the workshop especially. So, and uh, I hope nobody's getting hurt by napping some stones. Uh, I hope it will be a great experience for you guys, and uh, thank you, Chris. That's a such a great experience, great moment for us and sharing and everything. So before we wrap up everything, uh, there will be closing remarks from uh, Safwan Noradi as the head of the research archaeology uh, research archaeometry research centers. Sorry. Uh. Yeah, thank you, Anton. Uh, I think I'm so happy because uh, yeah, until more than 3 p.m., everybody still adjust <laughs> to snap, to break the stone, and you know, they already have their own uh, souvenir. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, 
after yeah this this is workshop so after work you can shop <laughs> for <laughs> yeah war tajil ya yeah. we have war tajil in indonesia <laughs> you can shop for tajil so yeah i would like to uh, uh, to thanks our speaker today uh, uh, professor chris larson and dr kasi norman for your kindness to, to share the, your specialty your knowledge Uh, to us, uh, not only uh, a researcher from Brin, but also our colleague from the museum, uh, from uh, from the universities, and also from the other uh, research organization in Brin, because uh, from uh, online there is also uh, several uh, researcher from uh, earth science, also oceanography, and so uh, I wish in the future we could uh, build. A tight relationship uh, in science, yeah, collaboration and scientific collaboration, yeah, more, more tight, not only with Birin but our colleague uh, universities also from museum in Indonesia. Yeah, I think uh, thank you so much for your uh, time and your for your coming in Indonesia. I, we we hope in Indonesia, uh, next time you could come again to Indonesia to do research together. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>